Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Diminishing Returns. We're going back to the 90s again today. We're doing the Men in Black trilogy, which began in 98, was it? Something like 97. That. 97, damn it. Which began in <laughs> 97. And uh, I am Alan Turing. With me, as always, is Sol Harris. Hey. And joining us, as she <laughs> regularly does, is uh, our special guest, Judy Bignall. Bonsoir. Okay, so we're gonna Biggie jump. Smiles. We're gonna jump right in, but I was Biggie th- Nails, Big Nell, Biggie Nails. There you go, got one. That's your rap name. I mean, got one. That's your rap don't, name. Don't encourage him. No, my rap name is don't, Big Jew. Don't respond. Big Jew. <laughs> yeah, but just about J U. Don't respond. Will Smith's a rapper. <laughs> That's why I'm doing this. <laughs> um, He's a rap star. He does the rap music. His name is Will Smith. We've barely got the title of the film out yet, so I'll pipe down. Well, Dimin- before, we, uh, before we go back, before we go Black. into Black. Men in Black, sure. um, I was hoping that, Sol, you would be able to give us some background uh, on where Men in Black comes from. Yeah. Go. <laughs> okay, um, The Men in Black was a, uh, a six-part limited-run comic book series i believe um uh i think very much of that kind of 90s government paranoia the same sort of thing that birthed the likes of the x-files and what have you Mm -hmm. uh my understanding is it wasn't a comedy it was quite dark and serious and um that was published by air cell comics which was later bought out by malibu comics which was later bought out by marvel comics meaning that Men in Black is a Marvel property, but one that is kind of separate from the uh, Marvel universe. You're not gonna see, you're not gonna see Chris Hemsworth as Thor hanging out with Chris Hemsworth as Agent Chris, whatever his name is in the new one. It, it was the weird decision as well to focus in on aliens because my understanding is the comic books are a lot broader than that, and they deal with you know. Everything from demons to vampires to aliens. To, like the X-Files, you know. I suppose. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Um, Maybe that's why. Maybe they had to not be too X-Files-y. But it wasn't a, a big, long-running comic either. It, it it was just a six-part thing, and they, they since, after the film, made a whole load of extra one-off little things and miniseries to kind of capitalise on the film. But, yeah, it was just quite a a little you know, one-off thing, really. And, um, yeah, somehow spawned this film franchise that was very loosely interpreted from it. Yeah, I mean, you look at the Pirates of the Caribbean, you can start anywhere, can't you? Start with <coughs> just a germ of, a, germ of an idea. A German idea. <coughs> Not a German idea. They, they're they making a big budget sort of action-y comedy in the late 90s. Obviously, you go straight to Will Smith, who... At this point, it was at his peak, really, you know, off the back of Independence Day. Uh, or perhaps at this point, he was still on the Ascendant. I mean, this was one of the films that cemented oh, him as a star. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is the couple of years before Wild Wild West. I was going to say, this was peak Smith before he began the decline um, with Wild Wild West, which was very much the spiritual successor to Men in Black. You know, it was Barry Sonnenfeld reuniting with Will Smith doing a kind of comedy double act thing. Uh, much of how they approached Men in Black 2 was dictated by the failure of, of Wild Wild West, uh, critically and artistically. Uh, but I suppose we'll get into that in more detail later. If we we go to this first film, uh, yes, we've got Will Smith, who brings all his Will Smithiness to it. Um, really, yeah, classic Smith. Um Fantastic charm, personality, charisma. He brings it all. Am I right? You're right. And once again, as we've seen so many times, it, it makes the it makes the difference between a standard film and a great film. But it's not all Will Smith. We've also got Tommy Lee Jones there. Will Smith is generally pointed to as this film's like guy the, the, yeah. the yeah that well the man who who sells this film makes this film 
But I really, I really think it's Tommy Lee Jones who carries this film. I really think he is the reason why this is a great film. Well, um, it's a it's a classic double act, and I mean, let's look at another mm. Will Smith film, for example, who, where you might double him up with, say, Martin Lawrence. Different, different feel. Kevin Klein. Um, yeah, so you know, you you got your Tommy Lee Jones there. It is a classic double act in the one kind of feisty, quick fire one, the one dour and miserable all the time. Um, but you know they learn to respect each other. Yeah. I would much, much rather watch Tommy Lee Jones and Martin Lawrence than uh, Will Smith and Martin Lawrence. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> That's a lie, and you know. It. Mind you, not at all. I would. I wouldn't mind seeing Tommy Lee Jones and Martin Lawrence, the actual people, sort of locked in a room together, <laughs> and just see how long it lasts. I just, I just don't think they'd talk very much. I just think they'd sort of be like on the phone to their agents. No, you got no, no phones. I think all Will Smith brings to the proceedings, really, over someone like Martin Lawrence, is he does a funny rap song over the end credits. <sighs> no, he's got he's got real character. He can bring character to like. Yeah, so's Martin any- Lawrence. Well, it's different. Are you are you? Je- like, I can't tell if you're being serious here. Are you saying that if you put Martin Lawrence in this film in place of Will Smith? It'd be basically the same. I'm saying if you put Martin Lawrence in this film instead of Will Smith, it would get away with it a lot more than if you put uh, uh, Sam Elliott in the. Actually, no, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> some some other old white man Jeff in the lead instead. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean Will Smith is more replaceable than Tommy Lee Jones is in terms of stuff, I, someone yeah, filling in? I, I, I just think. Personally, for me, Tommy Lee Jones is so much more of what makes this film. But then I don't but know. I, I don't know how much is, of that is dictated it's how they by work off each other. Yeah, it really is. They're such a like Alan said. It's a double act, and they. I think that's why they're so good in obviously getting ahead of ourselves, but in two and three together as well. It really the stories pin on their relationship and the fact that they the way they act off each other, mm. or oh, the way yes. they contrast to each other as characters. Yeah, I mean, I, I used to love Will Smith as a kid. Then I grew up. Then I kind of got sick of him, and so now I'm just kind of I don't know I, I I'm I'm almost I mean he's he's good in this so you know I'll give him some credit. <laughs> well, I'll tell you who is <laughs> irreplaceable in this film, and that's Vincent D'Onofrio, who is that bug man who plays Bug the Bug or whatever he's called. Kind of, um, Put my hands on my hair. That's very good, actually. <laughs> Jesus, you won't need to put in a voice clip for that. You've got a uh, soul. How do you spell his name? Vincent D- 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 D'Onofrio. I, mean, I, 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 can't, I can't overstate how fantastic his performance is in this. I think the way he embodies uh, um, an alien in a human skin <laughs> is quite his, fantastic. His performance is astounding. It is. I, I think it's... And I, I think brilliant. It, I, I mean... I, that's not what the film is being sold on, unlike the chemistry between your leads, but I think it adds so much. I think it gives yeah, that completely. that villain a really creepy presence when he doesn't... He's, he's not a very physically it, threatening mix, thing until it? kind of right yeah. at the end. I don't know. There, there is, he's quite menacing in that he's quite unnerving. You know, yeah, when he exactly, pulls yeah. his skin taut over his face, that sort of thing. <laughs> that's like... That's real horror comedy territory they're getting yeah, into. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he, yeah, he does strike a very nice balance, I think, between menacing and funny. But it's great his whole character movement and and, and everything he does, and obviously the makeup really adds to it. They just sort of like pull his skin down a bit, and uh, but they do a very good job of uh, of it in quite a simple way, relatively speaking. But yeah, so I I, I love Vincent D'Onofrio in this. Um, I think it's the thinnest I've ever seen him. <laughs> in, I, in I, I think this is the youngest I've ever seen Tommy Lee Jones on a similar <laughs> Oh, well, weirdly, I thought he looked younger in Men in Black 3, and I was going to ask what, what that was about. Are you j- not when he's Josh oh, Brolin, you, you, not when he's <laughs> Tommy Lee <laughs> Are you joking? He looks so old in Men in Black well, Maybe 3. it was Men in Black 2. Oh, and my of. God, Men in Black 3, yeah. It's I think like it must 1 be and 2, he looks more. exactly the same, and I was like, oh, shit, he's got away with a lot. And then you see 3, and you're like, ah! um, <laughs> man. Okay, let's have a ten years. Let's have a quick, quick quiz. How old is Tommy Lee Jones in many, in nineteen ninety seven? How old is he in this film? I want to say thirty seven. Thirty seven. <laughs> Sixty. No, come on. Forty. Forty two. 
Is that your serious answer? 58. Hang on, give Wait, me a serious answer. 1997. Yeah, in 1997. Yeah, in this film, in Men in Black. I reckon he was about 70 in <laughs> Captain America. Okay. So that means he must have been about 70 in Men in Black 3. Mm. Maybe a bit more than that. Okay. Which means he must have been about 60 in Men in Black 3. So he must be about 55 I'm going to say 45. Like 45. You, okay. You think Tommy Lee Jones is 45? Uh, okay. He, 50, let's go with 56. He was... Well, in 1997, he turned uh, 51. So he's probably 50 when this was filmed, maybe even 49. Uh, Yeah. Shit, me. Well, you think he looks younger than that? Yeah, I'd say, well, it's hard to tell. Tommy Lee Jones is one of those people who's looked 55 for for quite some time. Well, that's what I mean. It's like, well, 45 wasn't that far off. You know who else is one of those people who's in this film? Uh, Rip Torn. Yes. Yes. Uh, so we get Rip Torn plays the chief of the MIB um, with his Zed. suspiciously dark hair. Hmm. Um, you lo- you're a big Rip Torn fan, aren't you, Sol? Um, I wouldn't say I'm a big Rip Torn fan, <laughs> but I like him. Are you a fan of his personal life, though, rather than his acting? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I am a big fan of that, yeah. <laughs> Him robbing banks and riding away on yes. on wheel like motorized wheelchairs. Yes, the things. reason he's yeah, not in Men it. in Black Three, as we'll get to, is because he accidentally robbed a bank <laughs> while drunk. Well, I don't know if you've seen Dodgeball, but I think I think people don't realize that was basically a documentary that they made. They just kind of followed him around with some cameras. <clears throat> well, uh, while we talk about actors, I just wanted to say that in general, that the small supporting roles, the little little like one scene mm. characters on this were really well cast uh really well yeah. uh, positioned tony shalhoub is a is a kind of obvious example because he's gone on to bigger things david yeah. cross turns up agreed yeah, yeah. yep linda Fli- Fli- fiorentino Fli- linda fiorentino yeah linda fiorentino who ostensibly is kind of well we we spoke about her a bit when we did dogma recently well, yeah, and I want to ask the same question as I did then. Is Linda Fiorentino on heavy sedative drugs all the time? Huh? Because she acts like she is. What? I think she's quite good in this. You're talking about the like the morgue lady, right? Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think she's on heavy, heavy sedatives? Because she just looks like she's asleep most of the time. She's playing the cool chick love interest. <laughs> okay. I think she's quite good at bouncing off the um the the, the Smith. Uh, yeah, the Smith and the Jones. So um I think credit to her. I think she's quite good in this. But mm. oh, I yeah. don't really know her from anything else though. I don't so think I, she's, I can't really think she's shit or anything, but it's the same in Dogma. She's she's not a bad actor. Yeah, she's not a bad actor. She just it just doesn't seem like she's doing anything particularly. I was I was reading into what happened with her and no one knows. <laughs> there, there was, there was some theories that maybe she was one of Weinstein's um, people, where they said, where they said no, and then Weinstein was like, right, no career for you then, and like had them blacklisted from Hollywood. Well, it looks like her acting career kind of stopped in two thousand and nine. Oh, it stopped well before that. She, well, she, she did drips and drabs, but I mean, she was. She was poised to be a huge deal, circa nineteen ninety nine. Oh yeah, no, no. I mean, there's, there's. Uh, I'm looking on her IMDb. So there's like 99, 2000, 2002, and then there's nothing until 2009, and then there's nothing. She did Men in Black and Dogma. I mean, that's what she did. Uh, that was off the back of Last Seduction that she uh, yeah. that sort of made her yeah. known. But yeah, I mean, it, she was sort of poised to become a big thing, but I don't know if... I mean, yeah, the only thing I've Kevin sort Kevin Smith didn't like her, did Yeah, he? the only thing I've really heard is that she was just a bit of a cow to work with, so nobody wanted to... Kevin, Kevin Smith's... Yeah, he was very vocal about disliking her, and then there were a lot of rumours that the likes of Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones refused to do a second Men in Black if she was involved, so they just... What? Very... Dis- just wrote her out with a line of dialogue. Anyway, more on that shortly. Mm-hmm. Maybe she was on sedative then. Maybe it was... Uh given to mm. her mm. i mean i i'm always a bit i don't know i i'm always a bit i'm i'm always a bit hesitant to throw a a, a, a strong woman under the bus as it were i've always sort of want to take it with a grain of salt but i don't know, that, that yeah. is i mean the evidence is there that career disappeared like there's something there's a reason for that you know 
Has anyone else really weirded out by David Cross having hair in this film? <laughs> Hang on, what, who does? Who's David Cross? The the guy is normally bald. Well, I got that from your statement, but oh, the hang guy, on. The, 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 the guy comes back in Men in Black Two. The guy who owns the like the DVD video place. That's the yeah. Two, yeah. Oh, sorry, I've gone blurred. Who is he? Well, in yeah, the first same one, then? same Personal. character though. Same character. So anyway, let's get into the body of the film itself. Um, this is a classic sort of neat script everything sort of plays mm, towards yeah. an end goal it's a really oh, it's really nicely written yeah very just tight. just so many great little set pieces and scenes that are so kind of fun playful but then have so much character and you know the scene the one i always remember um probably the most iconic part of the film for me bizarrely is the one where will smith pulls the table across the room <laughs> When they're trying to fill out those yes, forms. Yeah. And you sort of see, ah, he he's a lateral thinker. <laughs> he's that guy. Yeah. But I love that. It's it's such a great bit of writing. And that whole sequence, that whole montage is brilliant. The the bit with him not shooting all those aliens because one of them has a tissue and then <laughs> then he shoots that little girl in the head because she's about to start some shit. <laughs> yeah. White girl in the in the ghetto at this time of night. Yeah. Brilliant. Very, it, it's, 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 it sets yeah. up the character, it sets up the world, and like you say, this kind of lateral thinking, they're looking for someone who's a little bit not judging people by the obvious, I guess, is the idea. Mm. What it really reminded me of, obviously this came first, and I hadn't watched this for quite a while, but when I came back to it was um, King Kingsman. Oh, when yeah, they Kingsman, have the, the montage and they're looking, you know, is it Eggy or egg, Eggsy? Egg, um, eggy, yeah. <laughs> Shut up, <laughs> Eggsy, um, and you know, literally doing the same thing as Will Smith. It felt like it set a, a template. Mm. I think yeah. we referenced that table scene in our Kingsman episode. Oh, did you? Oh, Just one more reason not to think Matthew Vaughn's any good. <laughs> so <laughs> he's a thief. <laughs> yeah. So we get we get a lot of that stuff uh, and and yeah the, the, but right from the beginning it sets it up like we have the opening credits over like this bug flying through space mm. and then it gets gorgeous squashed. gorgeous score like mm. some of Danny Elfman's best work this film yeah um, really really oh, fantastic high praise theme. great music I mean I think it's a I think it's a good you know good score but some of his best work is quite a, an accolade I mean, I believe he got an Oscar nod for this. Jeez. And it, I mean, that I, I should qualify that with this was back when the um, when the Oscars had a separate category for comedy music and proper music. But mm. um, I think that might be one of his only like I don't think he's been nominated many times, Danny Elfman. It's a shame. But no, I, I think it, I think it is some of his best work. I think it's a fantastic uh, film score. Mm. And you know they they they're still really really leaning into that theme tune very heavily even in the new film coming out, which is surprising because yeah. I don't think it's a particularly iconic bit of music. I don't think the average person would recognise it. No, no, good point. But yeah, that open that opening scene we have a you know this this bug that gets smashed onto a windscreen, which you know we have a bug as a villain later on, yeah. and then this is a van carrying mm. illegal aliens, and but one of them's actually oh, an alien. So all ties it's, in it's, so it's, it's poetically. Yeah, it's all quite straightforward, but it works. Well, that's I was going to say the whole the whole story really is something so simple, and the concept is so simple really, mm. and they've just managed to build on that with all all the attention to detail is is in all the small, like you said, in the supporting characters, in the stories they have, and in the, in the gimmicks. But it doesn't get a complicated story, and I think that's really a, a highlight and a strength of of the film, and actually of the, you know, of the of the series. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I um, I want to just mention the the special effects work mm-hmm. again. Just amazing, amazing. Like for for 1997, such a great yeah. blend of practical effects, mm-hmm. little bits of CGI where necessary, but. So many wonderful bits of you know puppety stuff and 
Yeah, love it. Which means it hasn't mm. aged. Like the CGI stuff they've got yeah. completely holds up. They they have a, a little neuralizer, a little flashy stick thing. Yeah, that gets a lot of use in this franchise. What <laughs> what a great concept. Yeah. What what a fantastic like get out clause for the writers. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and they really push it to its limits, don't they? But they they really get a lot of comic mileage out of it as well, which mm. I think I think that's a big part of why it works so well. Yeah. yeah. And you know it, it it's just just a great plot device. Love it. Quite an iconic element in these films as well. You know, you, you could if you dropped a flashy stick thing that makes you forget stuff into another film, it would be a Men in Black reference. Mm. You know, it yeah, it would yeah. be and people would know what you were doing. That's that's kind of it. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Um, what else we got? That opening scene with uh, Vince D'Onofrio. Dion, Dion, Don, Don, Dion, Dion? Donofrio. That's cool. <laughs> Bugman. That opening scene, how great is that? When he's sat in the farmhouse, but it's that exterior shot. And you're just waiting for this um, this spaceship to come crashing in like a meteorite. Mm-hmm. And it's there the entire time, but you don't notice it until about... You know, the last few seconds. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Yeah, very nice. There's some really nice little directorial flourishes, actually, yeah. throughout this film. And it's not a film you'd really think of of, of as having them. Barry Sonnenfeld isn't someone I think of as being a... Uh, I, I always think of him as being more of a hired gun kind of director. Yeah, well, what, what happened to him? Because... Was it Wild Wild West? Did that just completely fuck him or what? Because... No, no, not at all. He... he um... He he was always kind of the the poor man's Tim Burton, but he did very well with that off the back of the Adams family. Well, yeah, I mean, he made Men in Black three, but that is in his CV that is mired in a in a sea of TV movies. You know, it's he, well, he, his last film, his last theatrical film, was the Kevin Spacey cat vehicle Nine Lives. Are you familiar <laughs> with that film, Alan? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Sounds like you'd like it, Alan. It's about cats. Kevin Spacey's mind is put into the body of a cat. <laughs> oh my god, so, why have so you not watched learn, this? So that he can learn to be less of a, a callous businessman and more of a loving dad <laughs> to his family, I think. <laughs> well, it sounds fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was something of a final nail in the coffin of his directing career, to be honest, <laughs> film directing. But yeah, I mean, he had men in, he's had Men in Black 3 and 2. But like you say, it's kind of largely been TV since about 2007. But he had a few big hits early out the the gate. Adam's Family, Get Shorty, Men in Black. And then he's had a load of like not particularly well-received films and sequels to Men in Black occasionally, which were also not massively well-received. Yeah, well, so, I mean, but I, like you say, I think there's some real flair in, in this. I think yeah. this is a fantastic mm. bit of directorial work. So what, you yeah. know, what went wrong? But do you think Men in Black 2 and 3 showed fantastic directorial Well, I, th- I think flair? they all tied together well, actually. I don't know mm. if I'm going to be the only one saying that, but like I just said, you know, I'm glad they... I'm glad they kind of kept him in the driving seat for all three of them, because I feel like they are all of the same ilk. They're all, you know... Mm cut from the same thing i think the third one feels quite like its own thing personally but largely down to the time between making them i think the second one feels very cut from the same cloth but it also feels very just lacking that spark the first one had it doesn't seem to have that same directorial energy about it yeah you know i like i like that cat yes of course there is a cat um something else that's been stolen by the marvel (laughs) cinematic universe (laughs) <laughs> Wait, really? What's the cat reference in Marvel? In the last film. Which film is it? The cat's name? Captain Marvel. There you go. There's an important cat in Captain Marvel. I mean, can you technically claim to steal an important cat in a film? Yeah, but it's a cat that like has more to it than you first realise. Well, yeah, but it's also not really anything like the same concept, even a little bit. So <laughs> <laughs> It's just exactly the same. There's, I swear there's other films where there's like, oh, there's more to this than meets the eye, and it's about an animal. Like It's it's exactly the same concept as Nine Lives, where Kevin Spacey's mind is put in the body of a cat. Because <laughs> there's more to that cat than meets the eye as well. It's got the mind Kevin and, Spacey in it. and voice of a... Uh... Ooh. <laughs> anyway... Um... 
So we have a cat. Uh, the cat gets involved in the investigation accidentally. Uh, they're but all... you don't really realise that until, you know, it's not obvious at first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the cat just hangs around the morgue. Cause that's what it's very, it's a bit of an emo cat. It's what loyal cats do. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that drags in the Linda Fiorentino character who is uh, sedated. Uh, a watcher, what you call it, whatever they call it, <laughs> the person who works at a morgue. What are they? Mortician. Mortician. Yeah. Some sort of mortician. blah de blah they have a fight with some aliens. <laughs> That's it, isn't it? <laughs> no! Well, hang on. You're saying there's more to the cat than meets the eye. Why don't you tell us what there is about the cat that is more than meets the eye? Well, it's got it's, a, it's a got a MacGuffin on its, on its neck, and that's it. That's all it is. Yeah, they're all just chasing this particular thing. Um, I thought it was quite interesting that in terms of the whole, you've got to get a, uh, the galaxy. The galaxy is what we need, and it's blah the blah galaxy. blah. That was very much an idea that I, was I, exactly the same in the I second one. Belt. Yeah, it's almost like the second film was a bit of a rehash, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was just a bit too close on that one. Mm. Yeah, we'll come back to that. But obviously, as a first we'll concept, we'll it's. Uh, yeah, there's a bit in there's a bit in the film where uh, Will Smith accidentally sets off this like bouncy ball that goes around oh, the office, yeah. smashing everything up. And the scene there where he's stood and like he's apologising and he's like, "Oh no, look out, look out!" This that oh that is full on Martin Lawrence style acting. Um, and there's not many people who can get away with that and still make it work uh, as a as a solid bit of comedy. But Will Smith manages it. Well, hang on, I'd, I'd say it's not as overplayed. Is it? Oh, he goes full, it's quite full man, Lawrence. Believe me. You know, you know how the Jeffrey Tambor impression is. You do as deep a voice as you possibly can. Yes. Judy, can you? Do you want to try it? I don't actually know what you're referencing. Say "Hey now" in the deepest voice you can possibly do. Hey now. <laughs> that was quite good. <laughs> that wasn't bad. I've got no point of reference for what this is meant to See, sound. You, that's like. the it's, that's the point. That's why it's so I funny. Sound more that's like why it works. If you knew me, the intonation of James it, it would, have, it would have been even better. Yeah. But I don't know what it is. Yeah. What is it? Um, my point is anyway. Will Smith's much the same. You just do it as loud as you possibly can, and it sounds like Will Smith. <laughs> Go on then. Oh no, I, mm, I I disagree. I think it could blend into Eddie Murphy. The louder you do it. Shrek, Shrek, I'm making waffles. Yo, Shrek, <laughs> I'm making waffles, Shrek. That's pretty good. That no, was, I'm, 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 I'm on board. Yeah. I'm on board. <laughs> <sighs> now say, um, Yo, Jeffrey! Yeah, say, <laughs> say, you ain't never had a friend like me. Wiki, wiki, wow. <laughs> you ain't never had a friend like me! <laughs> I'm, I'm doing it like a wrestler for some I don't reason. Think I was, you I've are. gone like Hulk Hogan. <laughs> I don't think Will Smith shouts everything. He does have a shouty element, but I, I think uh, he, he, he has a softer side. He does bring it down. There was an ex accident. Was an accident. Yeah. <laughs> so, Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the where film. were we? <laughs> Men in it's Black. Good film, isn't it? It is a great film. It's funny and it's got action, but it's not too action. It's got some great, just just wall to wall great concepts and ideas. Mm-hmm. Cool futuristic gun things. The cat. The cat's called Orion. It's on his belt. It's funny. The dog that talks. Dog, dog talks, yeah, Frank the Pug. That seems to have really caught on as a popular character. I'm not quite sure that I'm I on board with that. Why. Yeah, and they really brought yeah. him back. Yeah. I, no, I, yeah, I know, I, I very much agree. <clears throat> oh, also, I did like I did like in that scene though, the where Tommy Lee Jones is interrogating him, so he's holding this pug and he shakes him about like. Oh, and he is just shaking well, a little dog. You can tell right? it actually is a dog because it kind of moves and stuff. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you're just shaking a dog now. <laughs> really vigorously it. shaking a <laughs> it's real quite dog. Quite aggressive. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, for, we, we talked about this quite recently um, with Godzilla. When I was saying I had a real thing for kind of late 90s Hollywood sort of action nonsense. And this definitely falls into that same category. This is comedy. It's Will Smith. You can't go wrong, really, this this particular time. So, yeah, I really like it. And I think it's a good, solid script. Shall we rate it? Mm. Are we rating it? Are we going? I have a really strong affinity towards Men in Black. I really love it. And I, I think it's sad that it isn't as 
highly regarded as I think it should be. I think yeah. Men in Black deserves to be held up as fondly as the likes of Ghostbusters. It is mm. one of the finest kind of effect, you know, big effects comedies ever made. It's quite a hard thing to make work, really, um, historically. Yeah. And uh, I think it's great. I do think, yeah, I think it deserves more than being in every charity shop. I gave it a very solid eight. Yeah. I, I also gave it a very solid eight. I kind of I kind of want to give it more than that, but if I'm... It, you know, it is completely... just a sort of throwaway comedy film, yeah. isn't it? You can't, you know, it's yeah. got to have yeah. some more meat to it. I think. But it is a yeah. very solid eight, yeah. you know. Yeah. But it's the same for me. It's a very solid, if not high, eight. Yeah, I think that's. I think if if you don't think that, then you're probably a weirdo. Yeah. yeah. Well, I I remember Men in Black was. I don't know if it still is, but I remember at a point it was Rotten Tomatoes' like go to example of a 100 percent fresh film in their database, like in their FAQ or something, mm. where they were like, "This is what happens if no critics dislike a film." I'm just looking it up now to see if it's still up. Oh, it's down to 92, you fuckers. <laughs> Do you want to talk about the end credits song? This, I mean, as far as I know, this pretty much was this the was this the dawn was this the creation the birth of a a, a genre of music <laughs> the the rap what? song over the end credits where you describe the plot of the film. <laughs> <laughs> no, had this happened before Men in Black? Robin Hood Men in Tights does that at the beginning. The people weren't happy. Morale was low. They had no place to turn to. There was nowhere to go. They needed a hero, but no one could be found. Cause Robin Hood was out of town. I said, hey. I said, hey. hey. I said, hey. hey. There you go. That's my reference. Good film knowledge. Thank you. Well, it was certainly um, a defining moment in Will Smith's career. And, and one that's kind of having a bit of an odd resurgence at the moment. Well, yeah, like, yeah. this because he kind of he almost felt it seemed like he was ashamed of his his cheesy rap roots in the last few years and yeah, then he went think... and did a, a rap credit song for Aladdin. Jasmine like a flower is the Ooh. grand you wishes it don't even cost a dollar yeah. you got in on the carpet when you rot and wanna hide a light tell me where you wanna go hold up don't tell me I already know watch out it's a genie with an attitude three wishes what I need to make true mister mister well I think it's it's the you know in the late 90s he was straddling both worlds he'd just become you know he'd gone from being a TV actor to a film star to the, a major A-list you know, Hollywood star over the course of about four years. Well, yeah, he was, he was still a musician. I think his last, I think his last album came out in like 2002, 2003. Millennium. Around the same time as Men in Black 2. Yeah. So, yeah and so he was still very much making music, you know? But, you know, he was making the money on the films. Was, and, you know, maybe it's just that, you know, it's not, you can't sing Parents Just Don't Understand when you're a parent, you know? It's like you can't, you have to move on in life. Rap is a young man's game. Yeah, and he it? did move on. He did just the two of us. Daddy, this is a very sensitive subject. Was that Michael Jackson? From the first time the doctor yeah. placed you in my arms, I knew I'd meet death before I let you meet harm. Although questions arose in my mind, would I be man enough against wrong? Choose right and be standing up. From the hospital that first night, took an hour just to get the car seat in right. People driving on fast got me kind of upset. Got you home safe. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the funny thing about Will Smith's rap career is that he was always kind of, it was never gangster rap, put it that way. It was never, you know, doing drive-bys in between. Are you rappers yelling about who you put in a hearse? Do me a favor, write one verse without a curse. I'm about to freak this. Aha, aha. Yeah, so he was always kind of a friendly Woo! face of rap, uh, which is obviously translated well for him in terms of becoming a big star. Having a career. Um, although a woo! Ice Cube was, wiki, wiki. was Triple X, so you know. Aha, aha! I'm just turning what you're doing into a rap song. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. I mean, 
It's uh, it's very, it's, it's probably the most iconic part of Men in Black. Yeah. The entire film, the the song, which plays a slightly increased tempo over the end credits for some reason. Mm. UK UK singles chart number one it was a number one Woo-hoo! in the UK. So Men in Black Two, they uh, they came back for a sequel. Felt like they waited a while, but it was only five years, which isn't that long. Will Smith is notoriously difficult to um, pin Get down sequ- for sequels. Well, they went off and every did. film he's ever made has kind of had a sequel in development hell for ages. It's just kind of languished because Will Smith. I mean, you, yeah, there was definitely a phase where it seemed like Will Smith didn't do sequels, and then all of a sudden he's in fucking everything twice, and Bad Boys Four is coming out or something, and it's like suddenly somewhere that that uh, you know that line got lifted. Well, he was always open to them. I think it was just, you've got to find out when his schedule opens up, pay him a hundred billion dollars, and... Uh... Is he not always famously against sequels? I thought he was kind of, That's I thought Jim he Carrey deliberately held out. Yeah. Um, no, really? Yeah, Will Smith's had sequels in development for most of his films. There were, there were, I mean, barely any of them have actually happened, but there was a sequel to Hancock that was hmm. being, you know, trying to get through development for the longest time, and he was gonna do it he was you know attached to it there was a sequel to uh i am legend with him in it i think a prequel that he was gonna do for the longest while and then i think it turned into a sequel with his son in it instead at one point and that's obviously never gonna happen Mm. bad boys 3 has been that in that territory for the last half many years independence day 2 was in that territory for a long time until they just said fuck it we'll do it without him Mm. Uh, Men in Black 2 to a point Men in Black 3 certainly was in that territory for a long while but it made its way out I think even the likes of iRobot might have had a a Will Smith sequel kind of banded about at one point that never happened he's he's had a lot of them Mm. oh fair enough so yeah I mean it was five years later by the time Men in Black 2 uh, made it to the big screen things have moved on, Linda Fiorentino's moved on to the film's um, detriment I think it just yeah. feels very. It feels like that would have been the injection of fresh energy in this 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 film. You you pair Smith up with her. And you have a kind of new dynamic. Instead, mm. they spend half the film trying to undo the events of the first film so that they yeah. can get back to the dynamic that worked in the first film. Yeah, because we we didn't actually mention in a plot recap of the first film that. At the end, Tommy Lee Jones' character basically retires, which means they wipe his memory and sort of send him off into the world. Which is an oddly, like, willing-to-be-finite way of doing a big blockbuster, isn't it? It's um... Well, I think it was back before they started rinsing every opportunity to create sequels, even when they were not welcomed. It's a shame, though, because I, I really think... I just think this series would be better if there was a bit of space between them bringing him back, you know? If the second film had been Will Smith and Linda Thingamajiggy, and then Men in Black 3 the was the one reunion. where you have to bring back Tommy Lee Jones, they have to go and get him back. Don't you think that would have been a bit more... Uh, I'll tell you what I would have done. I would have gone with Tommy Lee Jones is in it like all the way through, but he doesn't regain his memory until quite near the end. And so yeah, the, the journey is him, uh, Will Smith and uh, maybe a new partner, like with him tagging along and having to like keep keep him up and he's just like a oh I just work in the post office I don't know what's happening and like he's quite a different character you know and then yeah. then finally at the end just in the nick of time he remembers what he needs to remember to save the world mm. I don't think that would have worked though because the problem is then you've got three and then by the time he's back for the third one you've then got to shift out someone who you've grown to like over the next one because they work in partners I, I think that no, would have been messier have, you can have three no, but you can't. Not in the way can. that they've set up the well, world. I wasn't thinking in terms of what happens in the next film. But what happen- What you do is you have Tommy Lee Jones as the Rip Torn character, and then you've still got your partners in there. He he's just yeah. pops in for a bit to, to slag him off and then walks off. You know what? That One of the one things the second film, I think, does do quite well is it finds a decent role for that Frank the Pug to say everyone apparently loved him so much that they had to crowbar him into the film. It's quite mm. nice when he's working as a little agent sidekick to a Rip Torn back at the base. Yeah, it was and that all works right. all right. Did and did you enjoy how his character was introduced in this film? No, <laughs> <laughs> it was a certain time of the world in which using "Who Let the Dogs Out" <laughs> in the film was comedy genius. 
Especially because yeah. I don't... Oh, hang on, that's not how he's introduced, is it? He is, he's no, in... but it's quite early on. He's in the car listening to the music. You know, whatever. But I think... I don't know if you've noticed... I, d- I don't know if you noticed all, but the, the joke is that he's a dog, you see. <laughs> that's why he's listening to that song. That, what I but do then... love with Frank the Pug in this in this film, which I never noticed on any of the hundreds of times I watched this when I was younger, amazingly, but they, they do just cut into a scene of them driving with him saying, For my money, it's missionary. Because <laughs> he's a dog, you see, Alan. So you'd think he'd say doggy style. That's yeah. that's it's clever. Yeah, that's clever. Yeah. Should we talk about the plot of this one? <laughs> We've got a new villain. Yeah, there's this chick, right? Selena, making me sick, right? Earth is worthless to her. She'd be tripping, like threatening me and my men's trying to get the light. Yeah, that's quite a succinct description, actually. So yeah, um, speaking of female actors who I don't, I've never quite understood. Larry Flynn Boyle. Larry Flynn Boyle has done loads of stuff, but she's never, I don't know, never quite. She's never quite had a big breakout, though, has she? This is one of her biggest roles. Yeah. So th- th- this film, we we praised the special effects in the first one. Mm-hmm. This has some of the worst CGI I think I've ever seen in it. Well, it's five years later and CGI is much more of a thing now, and it's not. it's no longer being used as a as a tool to top up your physical effects. It is just used as it in its sort of a standalone thing. But there's there's a whole opening sequence. They they obviously thought, well the first one was so great when we had that CGI bug flying around and it worked. We'll do a similar thing. So they have a CGI spaceship blowing up planets. It looks like shit. <laughs> and then that CGI spaceship lands in the park and it looks like shit. <laughs> it looks like it looks like playing a, a shitty little game that puts a, a spaceship over the camera on the Nintendo DS. It's that level of like, oh, it's just, it is awful. It looks awful. <laughs> what the fuck were they thinking? Just have a real fucking little metal pod. How hard would that have been? <laughs> just have a prop. Okay. Um. So, <laughs> Selena played by Lara Flynn Boyle, is the main villain. She takes... Bit of, um, bit of male gaze in this film. Well, I was going to ask about this, because she's an alien that can sort of change shape, I guess, and sees a magazine with a lingerie model, uh, and so, so like, takes that form. Um, it's, not a, it's not a bad idea, per se, but the way the magazine is just laid out, pristine condition, like in the middle of the park, and then as the little worm comes up to it, a gust of wind blows several pages open, and it opens perfectly on the one with the Victoria's Secret model laid out. It's, it, it's yeah, a bit. It's, it's, if, if, the, if the character had done something where it sort of realised that the best way to get ahead in life, and the best way to get people to do things for you is to be an attractive woman, like that at least would have some sense of... I don't think she tries to seduce anyone at any point in the film. It's kind of just really for the sake of it. And they don't even get any comedy out of it, like like Terminator 3 style, when the Terminator makes its boobs bigger to get a policeman to <laughs> like leave it alone. It doesn't do anything like that. Yeah. They do, however, go immediately for a rape joke, which seems a bit dark <laughs> for a what, a PG PG film, twelve, maybe? Oh, it's so that she can eat him. Yeah, classic bit of rape comedy. Um, it was a different time, but also she she eats him and then comes out, realizes that that's made her fat, and so um, you know vomits him back up in a, a classic bit of bulimia comedy as well. So you know, and it, yeah, and it's not like this is established character that knows what's attractive to humans or whatever. And, you know, yeah. it just doesn't quite make it, any sense. Th- yeah, it feels like there were some ideas that, and you know, at some point in the script that just never in got fact, properly... the idea is that she's been... Oh, well, this creature has been on Earth before in the 60s yeah. and met Tommy Lee Jones. So having her co- take the form of something from the 60s, like Marilyn Monroe or something, she's like, oh, yeah, this, yeah. this is what people like. This is what will get me results. That yeah. might have been a... Yeah better way to take it and then like has to change later on yeah anyway then we we meet up with will smith see what he's up to what is he up to well he's he's the straight man now kind of which is something barry sonnenfeld was very unhappy happy with and said after after making wild wild west he was just bending over backwards to get tommy lee jones back into the film as soon as he could because will smith couldn't be the straight man uh but when he but while he is the straight man sort of he's paired up with patrick warburton <laughs> 
<laughs> Agent T. Peter, my legs don't work. That's a classic <laughs> Family Guy joke for you there. <laughs> As voiced by Patrick Warburton. I, I voice every cartoon ever made. Yeah! <laughs> All right! Okay, yeah. <laughs> Are you moving on to anything, or are you just... You're doing Patrick Warburton and Matthew Lillard. <laughs> Lil Lillard. That's not, like, that's not Patrick Matthew Warburton. Matthew Lillard's kind of more... Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's when he's doing scoop. Yeah, squeak, yeah but Patrick Warburton is like down here. Oh, uh, squiggity squeak, squeaking. <laughs> that's Patrick Warburton. There you go. <laughs> please, let's move on, please. <laughs> squeak, squeak, nip. Uh, Peter, my legs don't work. <laughs> Peter, Family Guy. Quality comedy on Family Guy. I'm in the Venture Brothers. It's a lot more. Better well written. <laughs> so we have Will Smith. It was in B movie. We, B movie. My point we was going to be B movie. Peter. Here, I really like what they've done with Will Smith. Here, kind of, he's become like K. Yeah. You know, he's the sage one, and he's the one that questions things, and he's got this, you know, not a whippersnapper in the same way, but he's got this yeah. guy that he's training, and he's just not feeling the click. I actually thought that was a really nice you know, mirroring there, and it isn't for the whole film, so it works. I kind of wanted this to be the the third film, and he's grown up and become a a really competent agent. And I just think it worked to show time passing. I, know, I, I, like, I like it. I To be honest, I don't buy the idea that we have to get back to Will Smith being comedy guy next to Tommy Lee Jones, like, immediately. I, I would have happily watched a whole film of Will Smith doing this, and Maybe maybe you get a bigger star than Patrick Warburton for him to go up against if it's gonna be for the whole movie, but uh Well yeah, but for the for the little I mean, for the opening action sequence, I think it worked really well. And actually I've gotta say, while we're going chronologically through, I'm a big fan of this opening action sequence. I think it it does exactly what it needs to do. It's a it's a good high pace thing. It's got comedy in there. Oh, the big subway worm thing. Yeah, oh. he's obviously he showed the guy the ropes, and it's like, right, don't antagonize this flower. And the other guy is—he's a rookie. He's, he's learning. What does he say, Sol? I, 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 my legs don't work. <laughs> That's the wrong character. <laughs> what does he say? His legs work. I'm in a diner, and you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. You like the big action sequence, basically. Yes, I think it's a good opening action sequence. Yeah, it's all right. It's it's solid. It's yeah. I think if any, it, 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 it's bigger than what we, what we saw in Men in mm. Black, or it's certainly more expensive. You can tell that. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, I, we didn't mention it, but apparently the ending of Men in Black was quite heavily reworked to make it bigger and more action focused. Apparently, it was originally just kind of Tommy Lee Jones having a philosophical conversation with the cockroach. Mm. But then they kind of went in, like, let's make it more exciting and action-focused. So I suppose they were just following through on that and probably had an increased budget. And Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they, they essentially end with a big spaceship crashing, but it just sort of crashes into the ground, kicks up a load of dirt, and it's not like a... Yeah. Well, you know, I, I didn't mention, actually, they, they, they quite heavily reworked the whole... It sounds like quite a shame, but apparently in, in Men in Black, the first one there was this ongoing war between two other nations and the cockroach people love there being war because they get to eat the dead people and they love the dead bodies and so his the villain originally was just trying to perpetuate war keep it going mm. so that his people could keep eating the uh, the other people so it was, a, it was a bit more interesting originally than what we ultimately got but they felt like they had to streamline it but some of the dialogue really does still tie into that like um you know, when 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 she's like, "I'm a queen in my in my world, and there'll be war if you do that." And he's like, "Good, more food for my family," or whatever he says. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, 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 you're right. Going back to Patrick Warburton, nice try. Uh, a little bit too broad for this uh, comedy universe. Doesn't quite feel like he fits in. Mm, yeah, maybe. Do you not think, I mean, I think... in in the first film, but that's the point. No, it isn't. In the first film, there's a real sense of the comedy here is born out of circumstance. This is very much the real world, and you've just kind of paired up these people, and there's these crazy aliens within this real world. But it's taken relatively seriously. 
The second oh, film um... throughout the film is a lot more like we've written gags, we've written like sitcom style jokes into this. We've written little surreal moments and Patrick Warburton just feels like a like I'm a different level of jokey sure. character to me. I, I I just I don't think Will Smith's character in the first one is particularly like real, relatable. I think he's likable, but I think the comedy that Will Smith has isn't meant to be like, oh, he's the everyday man. He is his comedy is bigger than normal. No, I don't know. I, I also, think I'm, know, I'm leaning towards soul here, you know. It's he's a well written in that he's very quippy and, you know, he's got more well, yeah, of a wit on him what... than a real person, but Agent T is like a big broad it's Patrick Warburton. It's he's he's like a blubbering buffoon. It's just it's a whole different level of like silly that you don't really get in the first film. Yeah, I know and what I, you mean, yeah. And and I just think I'm just pointing to that as an example. I think this is how the second film was written all together. It, it's full of comedy bits that are just a lot more come on guys, we've got to punch up the jokes, add more mm. jokes, let's bring in a comedy I think, guy. I think two and three are blurring in my head then. Can you can you give me some examples from the second one that you're talking about? Well, alright, there's Agent T, uh Michael Jackson. I'm looking at my notes. Michael Jackson, yeah. Uh I think I think Johnny Knoxville is supposed to be a broad comedy character. Yeah. Um yeah. It, I mean it doesn't none of it lands, so it doesn't feel that way, but I think it's written like that. Well, there's the men um, who let the dogs out bit is a good example of it. There's the bit I really do like, although it fucking feels out of place within this film, which is when when Will Smith says neuralizes David Cross in this film and says, you know, you're gonna move out move your out mom's your place, contact. you're gonna go get get some lobster, lobster, blah 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 blah, and then the end of the scene is David Cross picking up a shovel and going, "Hey, mom." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's my favourite joke in the film, I think, but it's also, like, so out of place and just very weird. I just, it just doesn't seem that out of place to me. I don't know whether it's because I watched the first one and then there was quite a gap and then I watched the second one, but, you know, the the whole bouncy ball around that thing and, you know, Will Smith giving what you described as Martin Lawrence reaction. But again, that's, and then that's him... Will Smith coming into this world and, and being a fish out of water, that ball thing. That's what I... Making a fool of himself. Where That's what I mean. He didn't come across like like a normal, a, just a normal guy. He came across like a big comedy Well, I, uh, again, really. I would say that is the one moment that really stands out as broad. Well, that's what about I... the squid being born and him being like, Kai! And it like flinging him around the car. Like mm. that feels very much. She the makes same a good argument, so I'm not gonna deny that. I think maybe it's just that it's less well handled in the second one, so it doesn't feel as smooth. It doesn't feel as natural, and and it's just sort of like, oh yeah. Quite. My, my general feeling on the whole for the second film was it, it felt like a different director. It felt like someone trying to imitate yeah. the first film. Yeah, yeah, it really does. Yeah, um, like just for example, the the opening, particularly the opening stuff, but the first sort of few scenes. So quick, the editing was just rat a tat tat tat, and then like you know, there was no time to catch a breath. It just felt like they were trying to make it. Oh, let's make this as short as possible. It's like a family film. Yeah, it's got to be eighty-seven minutes. Come on. Barry Sonnefeld was desperate to get to. Apparently, he just was like maniacal when it came to editing down everything that came before Tommy Lee Jones appearing. He was desperate to get to that as soon as he could. And I think it takes them like 17, 18 minutes to get to it, something like that. And I, I just think you don't need to. I, I'd happily watch quite a lot more of this film without that. Um, yeah. But he was burnt, you know, he had his fingers burnt on Wild Wild West. And I, I don't know, he learned the wrong lessons, maybe. So anyway, we we can we talk about uh, the character played by Johnny Knoxville? Yeah. That's weird, isn't it? Yeah. Firstly, <laughs> really fails to add anything. <laughs> yeah, well, it's supposed to be like the henchman, isn't it? It's like a little yeah. idiot stooge. And but he then has a henchman below this guy as well. Yeah. Ball chi- he's a ball chinian. There you go. That's another another Ooh, joke that yeah, feels nice. very uh, out, wouldn't fit in the first film. Yeah, it's a he's bad. a ball chinian. That's a bad joke. But yeah, never um, quite took to the acting, Johnny. Uh, mm-hmm. And he has two heads in, in this film. Uh, which is not to make him not an alien. really used very well for comedic effect. <laughs> well, also, no. also shit special effects, but yeah. Um, yeah, just yeah, I don't know, really, just just adds nothing. Yeah, 
we've got uh we got some really great special effects work when they get back into practical territory actually in this film the cgi is horrible but when they get back to men in black hq and it's like an airport and it's just full of aliens walking around Mm -hmm. they all look great they're all fantastic yeah i mean i kind of thought that in the first one though you know it I think the design of headquarters has changed for this one, or you know, yeah, it's more like, to it's show more time like passing, it's now, been upgraded. Yeah. But it's got a you know, the, King in it. the, <laughs> the idea of the customs in the first one and the effects of the aliens, I still thought was pretty decent, actually, for a kind of a yeah. I'm not saying um, they weren't. I'm a, a saying that's yeah, the, yeah. The, the, I, we said the special effects were great in the first film and they really hold up. Yeah, we were kind yeah. of saying they were shit in the second one, but when they get back to the practical stuff in the second one, Yeah, the practical really well stuff again. is much stronger, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I think the main offensive thing with the CG in the second one is that bloody spaceship at the beginning, and I, yeah, I thought exactly thing. the same yeah, as you yeah. saw. It was, I was like, oh shit, I don't remember it being this bad. And then you go on and you see the other stuff, and you're like, oh no, it's actually, that's not that bad. I mean, Jeff's a little bit questionable. That big foot alien in the airport who just puts his foot down in the background. Lovely idea, but again, just the CGI is just not great. There's a lot of very sequely stuff about this film. Uh, making Frank the Pug a partner up front is so sequely, but it feels very yeah. natural, like a, a, a logical well, progression of things. I don't dislike that. Uh, it's an environment where promotion, I think, is easy to put into a film. Yeah. Because, yeah, you, and you it, know, it's a work environment. It feels like so. a largely maybe not organic way to bring back that character but it's not contrived to the point that it's upsetting they do have to contrive and bend over backwards to bring back k and that is Mm. the bad kind of sequely where it completely undermines the first film Mm. and just feels like they're ramming a square peg into a round hole it also just it means there's so much about this that has to undermine the first film so having having uh what's her name gone with just a line of dialogue oh we got rid of her that just feels very dismissive and like you're just throwing away you know again undermining the first film the the fact that agent uh agent k kevin his wife left him after the first film again that just feels like it completely undermines the ending of the first film and but it's obviously (laughs) because they were like we've got to we've got to just write that out really quickly so well i like that because the first film it's basically just oh it's this girl that he loved 40 years ago and they're like you know obviously he's never had a a real life since then so that all felt a bit contrived anyway the idea that he's just gonna come out of a coma and then they're all gonna be like yeah, but in the context of the first film, it's yeah. just a nice little nubbin, isn't it? And it gives exactly. him a happy ending. It gives him the kind of riding off into the sunset that he deserves. And I, do, I, I think they really missed a, a a beat where by having him as K, but he doesn't. He's in the post office. You know, he's the same character, that miserable sort of dour person. They, I, I, they pretty much did, didn't they? That's what they do. That's what I mean. I think that's a that's. No, you've missed my point. I think that that's the wrong choice. It'd be nice to just have him as a totally different character, like he's because he hasn't got those life experiences. He has a new lease and he of life. Yeah, exactly. He's like just yeah, have him as much I, more of a sort of fun loving guy. He sort of switches back, you know. Yeah. But there is comedy there to have him as Agent K, but he's in a post office and he's still the same miserable bastard. Anyway, the uh the big new notable cast member i would say is rosario dawson once again bringing far more to a project than it deserves Mm -hmm. yeah yeah just what she does isn't it she she just does films that don't deserve her and yes is this uh laura yeah yeah who basically does the same job as linda fiorentino you know yeah so pops up is a bit of a anchor around the interest for will smith yeah move on they never quite nail those characters, do they? They never quite sort of yeah, give them the, the, yeah. sort of the material they deserve. I've made them know the light is on Bruno's belt. I don't really know what that means. Who's Bruno? Oh, the cat. It was the cat she says hi to. She takes things out the cellar uh, and she's like, hi, Bruno. Why do I remember that? <laughs> I've made a note for you, Alan. Yeah. Stephen Merchant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> is he in it? <laughs> no, no, it's, uh... And, and don't bother telling the story about uh, Men in Black 2 either, because I don't think people would be interested. Um, uh, actually, on the subject of Steve, Men in Black 2... <laughs> what? Have you seen that, Steve? No, I haven't, Carl. Tell oh, me about you it. you should see it. Go on. Why? Because there's this, there's this, um, there's this thing in it. <laughs> Go on. Uh... What, a stupid, bald, Mancunian tosser? No, weirder than that. There isn't anything weirder than that. 
<laughs> hey guys, it was gangly. <laughs> <laughs> Keep talking. <laughs> I'm, uh, you've got to see it because you wouldn't believe out the likeness and that you've got to see it out tonight. <laughs> right. It's not as weird, it had a normal voice, right? <laughs> I'll tell you what, mate, it ain't worth coming in next week. <laughs> oh, oh, stay on the line, Carl. Play a record player. <laughs> so, yeah, we've got Rosario Dawson. We also get the return of characters that we didn't talk about in the first film, uh, who are... Well, we have Jeebs, who we mentioned. He comes back. No, no, we're talking about... Are they called... Are they the, the worms? worms? Is that how they refer to them? The worms? Yeah. Oh, the worms, yeah. yeah. They're weird, they're, they're brought they? back in another f- apparently popular character that yeah, needs to come yeah. back. But they're vile. <laughs> Again, very um Who likes them? Weird sort of I well, let me know, ask you a question. that just feels a bit dated. I felt like they really just did the same thing that Frank did in terms yeah. of being like I am a gruff little Oh no, that's Harvey, what's his face? Um <laughs> no, you I know, mean, gruff yeah. little I gotta call my mother voice. <laughs> Yeah him. <laughs> they have to the our, our principal characters have to Go on a journey of discovery and uh, trying to. They have to go on a. Uh, they have to go on a parody of The Witness, because that had Tommy Lee Jones in it. Is that right? Oh yeah, it, it's weirdly. Um... Am I thinking of the right one, The Witness, or am I? Or is it The Fugitive? Actually, oh fuck, which one's which? Witness Harrison is Harrison Ford. Ford. Ah shit. No, the Fugitive is Harrison Ford. No, Fugitive is Harrison Ford as well. But there Tommy you go. Lee Jones is in. It's it's The Fugitive. Oh, sorry, okay. it's The Fugitive. <laughs> it's uh, they they do yeah they do very full-on parody sequences of the fugitive that that whole bit with the the diner and the arrows pointing around the room and everything is like a big is spoof it? of a scene in the fugitive yeah, yeah. Do you know what? i haven't seen the fugitive for so long i can't remember i only know this because when i, I watched the fugitive for the first time it was after i watched men in black 2 and i was like, like this is oh, enough men in they're, black they're doing that scene from men in black 2 that tommy lee jones <laughs> was and it was like oh i guess they were just doing a whole thing with tommy lee jones spoofing his own movie then okay that's a bit weird and here they they do after having established will smith's character is now like the you know the expert and he's the big agent as soon as well, tommy lee jones comes he plays back up the scene, he goes think. back to being like the sort of rookie who doesn't quite know what he's yeah. doing and which and i like, didn't oh. like well no 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 hang on that that that's not all true. He tries to pull rank. He's like, well, considering I have 14 years experience and I'm the senior agent, or is that in the third it's one? It's only not thing? true when they get to the car, which has been upgraded with a PlayStation controller, and uh, oh, he doesn't yeah, know sorry, how to I'm drive thinking it. of the third one. But the rest of the film is very much... And yeah, I think it's a shame, because it, it, just, it just feels kind of cheap. I would have had more bickering push and pull the whole way through, I think. And maybe the character arc would have been built around Tommy Lee Jones kind of accepting that Will Smith's character had grown and was a capable agent of his own and not like a little kid that he needs to talk down to by the end. Maybe that. It just feels a bit cheap to revert everything back to square one mm. like immediately, which is kind of what this film does. Mm. Yeah, maybe. So You know what else I... is shit? Yeah. The, the end. The ending of the film. What, her flying away? Yeah, just all of it. You're the light. Get in a space pod. Blow up the worm. It 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 rains because you cry. The 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 point is that the MacGuffin that they're dealing with, which in the first You're my film, kid. in the first film was literally the Earth is going to be destroyed in, in at this second, uh, and they have to do it. Whereas this one, the MacGuffin is kind of a bit more ephemeral, and and you know our villain is just trying to kill everybody, and then you know they figure out oh you're the light. Send her off. It's just a bit of a damp squib ending, isn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, Men in Black 2 is kind of... I think it's a go-to example of a bad sequel, isn't it? That is, it's often referenced what? as a bad sequel. Well, what did you find out? We're partners, I guess, and we fight aliens? Like Men in Black? Men in Black. Men in Black. I have Men in Black 2 in here. So, so you get the general idea. <laughs> Not quite. It's basically an endless string of callbacks All to... right! Save it for YouTube. I'll keep looking for clues. Alright kid, I don't know much aside from the fact that Men in Black 2 is a joyless cash grab, but I do know that whatever you have brewing around in your noggin really connected with you. Bad definitely feels like a strong word. It's definitely not as good as the original. It's definitely kind of like diminishing returns example. I I don't I think Alan's right. It, bad is too strong a word. It's it, like he said it's not as good as the original, but so many sequels aren't. But I actually I still found it really watchable. 
and there's some really nice charming moments in it still i i you know i i wouldn't be opposed to owning the film i mean i do own the film i agree with pretty much everything you said but it has 39 percent on rotten tomatoes it, it, um... okay well, i'm not asking what they're thinking though it's i mean fair enough it might be not critically well, well received what i was but... saying it, it wasn't very it's not a very highly regarded film it's not considered to be a particularly successful sequel I think we're kind of in the minority by saying it's it's all right. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's a shame that it's not regarded a bit higher than 39%. I don't think it's that bad. I think it's all right. I, I like it. It's it's a lot weaker, but I think the first film's just so wonderfully put together. Whereas this yeah. is just a messy, much more slapdash, throw it together kind of thing. Yeah. A lot of stuff doesn't work, but a lot of stuff does. And the rap song's better, isn't it? I am the man in black. I'm back, breaking the back of the random attacker. So can the flack. You want dangerous? I've been trained to bust. When a stranger bust, trying to endanger us. Praise me, y'all. Don't nothing phase me, y'all. When they see me, they gaze me, y'all. Crazy, y'all. They say I'm a myth. Trust me, if somebody rip out of the depths of your imaginations, appears Will Smith. Black suit, the black shades, the black shoes. Well, the, the rap song, <laughs> funnily, I, I did notice that this felt like moving with the times, you know. This was definitely a rap song from a post M M world, you know. A uh, different feel to it. A little bit more <laughs> aggressive for Will Smith. Yeah. I don't know why that was funny, particularly. But... <laughs> Just your one rap <laughs> reference from, like, post-90s rap is M M. No, I'm talking specifically. This song feels like an M M song. And, like... Soul, he knows who N.W.A. are. Alan, do you know Trey Knox is? <laughs> Trey Knox. Uh, no. There you go. Okay. Well, I'm glad we all know now. <laughs> is it the person <laughs> who the co-wrote uh, Nod Your Head? He, he, yeah, featuring Trey Knox, yeah. Oh, there you go. Men in Black 2, would you like to rate? I'll give it a 7. It's quite a weak 7, that, but I'll give it a 7. Yeah, I was going to give it a 7. <laughs> I give it a six. Not quite as generous as you fools. Well, actually, I was surprised that Sol... I, I mean, I was thinking, oh, God, after what he just said at the end there, I'm going to be rating this quite highly, but I can't bring myself to br- put it as low as a six. And I really thought, Sol, that you were going to give it a six after what you said. I said I said it. I said it's not very well regarded. I like it. Yeah, but then you also went, nah, it's just a bit, you know, it's not a great sequel. Well, it's and... not. The, I, the first film was fantastic. It, it really did waste the potential of this franchise and just sort of shit it away on something quite forgettable and nothing But, you know, that doesn't and mean yet, it's... the difference in Mark is only one Mark. I know you're saying it's a weak seven and a high eight, but it's well, still it's a still very watchable, eight. enjoyable it's film, isn't it? it it's... I like the bit where... Will Smith's in the fight at the end and he falls into some plastic tubing. And he takes like 30, 30 <laughs> yes. seconds. Yes! Oh to my get off it. god! That actually, That's yeah, one of the most relatable bits that. of the film. There's a special feature on the DVD where you can watch the Foley artists doing that bit. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see that. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> and then uh, 10 years later, they. they Finally pulled Dragged together Tommy Lee Jones out of Men in Black Three some... for a kind of at the risk of being sounding too down on it out of the gate. Um, I don't know. There's there's a real air of tragedy about this film, don't you think? <laughs> but I think that air of tragedy is Jermaine Clement. Oh no! <laughs> Whoa. Okay. No, go I again. Think, no, no, no. Out the gate. I think that is. I mean, I actually warmed to him, but I think at the beginning you kind of go. Oh, what's happening here? Really? No, I think up up front you're like, oh wow, what a fantastic villain they've got! Wow. Oh, I think the de- villain design and character design, and uh, I liked that. But I was like, what is Jermaine Clement doing? No, I love it. I love it, and I I loved it first time I watched it. Jermaine Clement, what he's doing. Boris the Animal's one of the few elements of this film that I think really does work very well. I, when I first saw Jermaine Clement, I thought, right, you know, you, Jermaine Clement's going to bring some real character to this, and it's not going to be a Lara Flynn Boyle situation. It's not a Johnny Knoxville situation. And he, and he no. does. It's much more of a Vincent D'Onofrio situation yeah, yeah, than a Lara yeah. Flynn Boyle one, yeah. Oh, but yeah, it's but... also very much Jermaine Clement being an actor rather than a comedian, tethering mm. himself back a bit. 
he's not. He, it, you don't get the sense he was doing any improv on set. Well, there's no, no. and that's all right. It, I, he's also not the comedy character. Yeah, yeah, all. that's that's yeah. All he's right. not funny. Yeah. Partic- there is a couple of comedy moments, but it, but that's it. I don't think he's really trying to be funny in it. That's the thing. I think he is approaching it as an actor. Bear in mind, this was this was pretty much his first significant film credit post Flight of the Concord. So I think he was approaching what? it a bit differently to. Um, when was uh, what we do in the shadows? When was that? Much later. Well, no, not much later. Uh, two years later, was it? Two thousand fourteen. Oh, okay. Mm. So this was his, you know. Oh, which? Oh, fair enough. Then I was complete. I wasn't thinking of that for some reason when I watched it. I was thinking of knowing what he's like now. But of course, it's yeah, seven years ago. Oh God, yeah. In which case, a lot more, a lot more credit and respect for what he did. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> I was, uh, I was looking at it from today's point of view. I think ultimately, I was a little bit underwhelmed by him or disappointed. Not, not that he does anything wrong, but I just feel like mm. with someone like Jermaine Clement, you could do so much more with the, with the yeah, character. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I remember watching this when it came out and thinking he was fantastic and not expecting that much from him. And now going back to it, it's a bit more like, oh, he could have done more with this. But like mm. I say, I think in the context of the time, I think he was, like I say, he was fresh off of uh, Flight of the Concords. That ended in 2009. He'd done a fair bit of like Taika Waititi indie films and little appearances on TV stuff here. But that, and voice work, um, he had a brief role in Dinner for Schmucks, if you remember that. <laughs> I can't That's, remember him in it. Oh no, like a... I don't remember his role in it. I imagine he was one of the schmucks. But this was very much, like I say, his first sort of proper big Hollywood role. So I think he was just kind of playing it safe. And, and you know, what we do in the shadows was his own thing where he was able to kind of do what he wanted with it. And I, I think it makes sense in his career there. And I, and I, I like him in it. I, like I say, I think, he, I think that character is one of the few parts of this film that doesn't come across as a bit of a mess. It's solid, yeah, I'll give, you, yeah, give him that. Yeah. You, Sol, certainly sound like you're going to be slagging this film off. Well, um, this was a this was a troubled production. It took it went massively over budget. They they had to like massively reshoot stuff. I think they pretty much reshot all of the time travel stuff. I think they were like rewriting. I th- I think they like shot all of the present day stuff, but then had to rewrite everything that happened in the past because Will Smith wasn't happy with it. There was a whole thing where Will Smith's trailer, which was like the size of a normal a normal block of flats in New York, was like <laughs> blocking a street for however long because he was just it. It was this whole thing. It was a very troubled production, and uh, the fact that it came together as cleanly as it ultimately does is quite remarkable, frankly. But mm-hmm. I think there are some messy elements and holdovers from that. But after after making such a big effort to get Tommy Lee Jones back for the second film and, and make that work, they uh, they're much happier in this film ten years later to jettison him in favor of a young Tommy Lee Jones. Well, that's because it's the same character and you've got roughly the same dynamic between him Mm -hmm. and uh well will smith and young tommy lee jones and of course they the saving grace here was that they found that josh brolin could do a a fantastic yes um, impression of tommy lee jones that just perfectly if not actually sounding all that much like him is just a perfect encapsulation of his persona and everything he does yeah probably about 20 years too old but still (laughs) And, I mean, God, Josh Brolin is... I don't think I ever kind of give him the credit he's due. I, I think he's he brings so much to so many roles that I never really think that much about. And, you know, when you just see him in something like this, it's like, oh, he, he is bringing so much to this. But I always think of him as quite a, an uninteresting actor, for, for whatever reason. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, he is um, too old, really, to be playing yeah. the young Tommy Lee Jones, but they... They kind of hand wave that, and you know they just make a joke about him looking old all the time, which is fair enough. Yeah. But the, interesting that he, he plays the, the same character, obviously, but in a very similar personality, and basically playing it the same way, which again isn't sort of like you're not having much fun with it there. But that's it. It feels like it feels like a logistical decision. Tommy Lee Jones is too old to do much filming now. We just have to write around that, as opposed to a natural thing the film would be doing otherwise. Mm. I mean, I think that was it. I think Tommy Lee Jones basically said he was too old to come back and do a proper big 
film at this point. Action and film. They were like, right, we'll make a time travel film to purely to get around that fact. We'll give you a few bookend sequences. Yeah. Boy, he is looking old in this one, isn't he? Ooh. I don't know about that. It's like Tommy Lee Jones. What, Tommy Lee yeah. Jones? He, no, he's looking a hell of a lot older in this one. It's just... Sylvester Stallone and bit Rocky bloated, Balboa. Isn't he? Just kind of like sponged out a bit. But they they have so they have Josh Brolin there as you know the same character, same personality, and all that. But then Will Smith's character keeps making all these references, like "What happened to you?" Like what? Like as if there's this young, happy-go-lucky guy there, and he's comparing yeah. it to the old sort of broken man, and he's like. What happened to you? You know, like what, what? You know, how did you become such a miserable get? And he's like, no, he's he's exactly the same. I didn't get that. But I he's didn't... never he's never even come across like a miserable get. Anyway, he's always come across like he's got a wry sense of humor and he's taking pleasure in his mm. work. To me, he's always come across like he's kind of you know having a bit of fun with it. Don't you yeah. think? Yeah, yeah. Some sometimes, yeah. <laughs> Just got very deadpan. Yeah. Style. Yeah. <laughs> But you, you get the sense he's in on the joke more often than not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, uh, uh, Agent Zed's dead. I guess Riptorn yeah. had robbed that bank at this point, had he? Yeah, yeah. Replaced with Emma Thompson. I'll take that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a good swap. Uh, a bit of an odd... I don't know. <laughs> maybe not an odd choice, but... Seems bit of an odd choice for her, I think. Yeah. yeah. But... I just think Emma Thompson's going to be turning down Men in Black 3 money. Who do you think she is? No, not the money, but I mean, in terms of the projects that she does, it just seemed a bit like, oh, Jesus, wasn't expecting to see her here at this stage in her career. But... Well, that's what I mean. We also have Alice Eve playing the young Emma Thompson, who was uh, poised to be a big deal circa 2012 to about yeah. 14. Yeah, I was going to ask, do I know her from anything? She seems sort of strange. Star Trek movie. Into Darkness, mm. she played the um, the Wrath of Khan scientist mm, who... That. Have become no, British out of seem... nowhere. Anyway, so we also we got Emma Thompson as the new sort of head of head of the bureau or whatever they are. Yeah, which, like I said um, before, the obvious thing to do would be to push Tommy Lee Jones into that character and then uh, have Will Smith with mm. a new partner. That would seem the obvious sort of sequel idea. Yeah, but... yeah, it never it never quite explained that. Did and it? and you know, again, we get. A complete rehash of Agent um, Agent T and Patrick Warren with um, Will Arnett playing mm-hmm. another bumbling idiot partner for for Will Smith. So I don't know, it, uh, but the, every but they, time they, they do they, this, they, I kind of think like I'd be happy watching some of these other agents. I don't need Will Smith to come back. Which hang on, which one do you mean? So it's when Will Smith wakes up and the time travel is fixed. Yeah, yeah, He's yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's literally just a little bit where he's coming down in the elevator, isn't it? And it's yeah, yeah and that's more about Will Smith. I think that's, really, that, that but it, it it almost feels like they couldn't. Yeah. I don't know. It it almost feels like they couldn't get Patrick Warburton back, except they obviously wrote him out of being an agent. In the, so it, yeah, I don't know. It's just it's oddly similar. Tell you what's a great bit of continuity between these films that I noticed on the rewatch. Yeah. So um. when he um uh, neuralizes. Agent T in the second film, he says, "Get married, have a load of kids." Yeah, and then he looks at the woman. Yeah, he looks at that woman at the diner and smiles, and she smiles back. Men in Black Three, that actor who played that that waitress, uh, is the mother who opens the flat. You know when he goes to Tommy Lee Jones's. Oh, house chocolate milk. And it's full of kids. Oh, it's the same woman. She she appears to just cool. be an extra who they was either someone they knew or just tracked down to get the same woman, because she hasn't got many credits at all. She's got like four or five credits. It's interesting. So it's just a really nice bit of continuity of that, because it's obviously meant to be, yeah, that is. you know, yeah. his uh, family, I think. That's the implication there. It's, yeah, it's just nice. Yeah, definitely. The, that whole chocolate milk thing felt like something that had been written on the fly. Like it, yes. Like it was like, what have we got nearby? I've got a bottle of chocolate milk. Can we use that? It almost certainly was just written into on the fly because, like I say, this whole film was being rewritten as they were like shooting the thing to completely overhaul the time travel bit in the middle, which is the bulk of the film. They get it gets away with it, but it's a having bit... a signifier that something's gone wrong. But then it's like, oh yeah, well yeah, that's actually a standard thing. Yeah, if you want chocolate milk, it's because time travel. <laughs> It, was, it doesn't make any sense. It was an interesting, it was an interesting and bold choice. I really thought it was just going to be that he had that drink 
And it was, you know, just a little comedy moment that, you know, he felt vulnerable and there was that kind of that comforting thing, maybe from his childhood, whatever, and he had a drink. But then the fact that, yeah, it turns into a signifier, they really didn't have to do that at all. It would have worked well, without it. They, they needed a, a means of getting some exposition. Emma Thompson realising. Yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a very functional way of doing it. It's, it's quite a smart writing choice in a lot of ways. I'm sure they could have done it better, but that seems like a real pro who's like, right, well, if we need to be filming this today, then I guess this will work. Send a runner out to buy some chocolate milk. <laughs> So basically, he has to go back in time to stop Boris the animal. You know, you know. I mentioned the whole um, male gaze thing in the in the second film. Doesn't really feel present in the in the first one. Does feel kind of present in this third one though. I think it's because there's a close up of the cake and the boobs are in the shot. Don't even know cake. what you're referring to. Yeah, what cake? The cake at the beginning that she takes into the prison and it's oh, just like oh god just that out into yeah the I wasn't cake. even thinking about her yeah there you go um, Nicole Scherzinger <laughs> is uh, yeah. makes a very odd cameo as Boris's girlfriend Busty. but that is just kind of like hey look at this sexy woman uh, Agent O as Alice Eve is kind of like hey look at this sexy woman um, she very much came across like a there's Miss a lot Penny. of yeah there's a lot of 1960s you know Andy Warhol hanger on Oof. type people who are kind of like look at these sexy women it, it, i don't know it, there is just That's a bit the, that is the point in that bit though isn't it i just feel like there's a bit of an issue with the male gaze in the two sequels that isn't really present in the first film it just feels like women are a bit more well they, they got set dressing they got round it in the first film by not putting any women in it it was very clever <laughs> you know, what's the name the morticians in it yeah one yeah, but she, she, but she <laughs> one, is one quite woman. a strong character who you know it's not perfect, but it's not. It's it's a decent. Effort I mean, yeah, I guess a, it... putting a strong woman in the film. I mean, arguably, the third one does much better by giving Emma Thompson the the kind of boss role. Yeah, but... yeah. But with the with the other people, I think it it is kind of justified when they go back in time because obviously it was a different time and women did have different roles. So maybe they can get away with it for that. Well, the thing, I think they never they never satirize that particularly, do they? And... Yeah, there's another issue I have with this film, which no, is not that... enough. They, ob- they they obviously have to address the fact that the 60s wasn't perhaps the most PC era. So they have the guy be yeah. like, just be careful, Will Smith, because you are black, <laughs> you know, uh, before yeah. he goes back in time. And then they pay lip service to it with the bit where he's pulled over. But there's still a, a black man at like le- like at the head of security at NASA yeah. On the lo- like, there's still yeah, a whole load that. of like that's felt quite but there's loads of like there's still a a black man and a woman like very openly like being lovers they, in public nah, without they, they were hippies cause... though they were they were like young hippie types yeah but they're so not the sort of but they're not love, even like not scared about someone smashing their heads in yeah they're not even like looking people. over their <laughs> I don't know just that the idea that Agent O was like. Actually, no. She she's not the boss in the olden days, is she? Well, yeah. that's I w- that's something I was going to say is that it didn't seem like a natural jump. You know, you were saying earlier about Tommy Lee Jones. Really, the natural step would have been to put him in that role. It doesn't make sense that Agent O seems to be kind of a secretary, and then somehow over the how many years she becomes. I think that makes sense. She yeah, she rises really through the ranks. ranks. What what would have made sense would be we get young Agent Z when they go yeah. back in time, which yeah. just seems like a bizarre thing to not put in thing there. not to have done also you know emma thompson would have been about nine years old when this film was set um, so that the, the time <laughs> doesn't work out why she's there but um that the whole uh agent o thing where there's something going on between her and uh, k again feels like that never it never goes anywhere really. it, 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 I was say gonna say that. See, it was either written in and then they lost it somewhere or they were half writing it as they yeah. went along well, it was really, the whole notion of it was really bigged up, like, don't ask questions you don't want to know the answers to. And it felt like, actually, the the climax, the reveal, was stuff that he kind of already knew, which is that something happened and Boris the animal attacked and he had to put up the arc net. Like, that was all kind of already a given. No, it was so all, I never that felt was, like was, I, got to, I got the reveal of the no, secret. No, the secret was that you know, his there was dad no died secret. there. That's the bit that he didn't uh, want to know the truth about his dad although why you wouldn't want to know that your dad died as a hero you know? like the fact that he's dead yeah you know that already so you've already dealt with that none of that works when you hold it up to scrutiny at all 
that's what I mean. This film's just messy. It's very fucking messy. It felt quite messy with the history, yeah. I mean, Jesus Christ, it opens with that, that scene with the cake at the start, right? Mm. And and the guard's going to open the cake, and he's like, I wouldn't. Oh, I wouldn't do that. Why's that? It'll ruin your figure. Ah! Oh! Ah! Ah! And then he shoots him in the head. Is that a good pun? <laughs> yeah. It's not, it'll ruin your figure, and then he, like, mangles him out of shape. <laughs> well, okay, but what what else is the pun going to be? Is it going to be, like, a minute on the lips, a lifetime of death? You know, what's... <laughs> <laughs> that's what's better. What's the line that's meant better. to be? That's, be- that's much better, yeah. <laughs> oh, or he would, he, like, if he <laughs> injected him in something and he bloated up and then exploded. That would... <laughs> yeah. Or yeah, or he, he shoots him with the thing and all of his insides, like, his guts all fall out and he's just like a hollow bag of skin and then he's like, empty calories. <laughs> 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 I'll tell you what it is, right? It's a chocolate cake. I wouldn't do that. Why not? It's death by chocolate. Shoots out of the cake because the little thing was in the cake. It shoots the thing out of the cake into his head. Death by chocolate. Is that a thing? It's a kind of cake. Yeah. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Death by Chocolate. Oh, that would have been lost on, lost on me. Quite a quite a famous kind of cake. Yeah, a line I made note of uh, just as an example of the bad writing or no making an effort or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. There's a line where Will Smith sees like an ugly alien and he goes, Damn! You look, you look like you come from the planet. Damn! <laughs> like, like that is <laughs> weak. I mean, that is That awful. was just... Uh, for Will Smith, though, wasn't it? That was to get some Will Smithery in there. But if that's your level of Will Smithery, that's that's basement level Will Smithery, you know? That is Even if level. it's him improvising, that's awful. That's what I expect yeah. from my you, you, you know what was improv in the second <laughs> film, for comparison, was uh, when the new car drives in, and they're like, oh, he comes with the autopilot now. And then Will Smith improv Yeah, well, it came with a black dude, but then it kept getting pulled over. And then they're like, yep, figures or whatever, and then move, walk on. That was the improv he was bringing to the other films, you know? And that's not to say that's amazing, but it's like, you know, yeah, he's trying. Seems like a written line. It's not Damn. just It's not just at the level that I basically did the same line trying to do a hack joke <laughs> making fun of Will Smith's improv <laughs> that turned <laughs> out to be the same line. <laughs> Having said that, I enjoyed the film. Mm, yeah. I, it I, was perfectly I, fine and entertaining. I enjoyed it more on the rewatch. I think I, I think I got too excited for this in the run up to it because I love Men in Black so much and time travel, and then I went to see it and it was just kind of a mess and yeah, it was all right. And then rewatching it, it was like, oh, it's all right, it's fine. But there, there's a lot of stuff I don't like in it, but it is fine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I it was interesting for me having that special experience of having seen it for the first time, which I hadn't realised was the case, um, because I actually found I, I had such a, a busy day when I was trying to watch it, so I was watching it in instalments, and I had to keep kind of, um, you know, leaving it and coming back to it, and I found myself really excited to be like, oh, I've got to watch a bit more now, and I was actually, you know, I was I was into it. I it really held my focus and. So many times recently I've had a film on in the background and it, it didn't feel like one of those. I wanted to watch it. So I don't know if that's just that it was a you know well put together film or whether the characters were engaging. It's Will it, Smith, man. It's Will Smith. Yeah, but I don't know. I think the story was a lot more convoluted. It definitely didn't take what I said earlier about having a simple idea. It mm. felt like a much more complicated idea. But it was still there was still charm to it. I think it's just it could have been a nice simple thing. They just make it unnecessarily messy and complicated i mean the time travel thing i can almost get on board with that's never going to be a simple idea however you do it but well, as it a... can be if it is just go back to 1969 and have an adventure yeah but automatically there's layers to it where it's like you've got to avoid yourself or something that naturally makes it a bit more complicated yeah only when they start writing bullshit into it like oh by the way you were at the launch of the fucking space mission to the moon that you didn't know about yeah that's when it starts getting complicated and bullshit. The concept of yeah, time travel would have held up on its own. Yeah, it could have just been Will Smith goes back to the sixties. But the, that that whole thing, oh, the 
the whole dad element really didn't it wasn't work needed. On hate any it. Level. it really and, didn't and they even need it. they try and set it up earlier by having him mention his dad that his dad was never around or not whatever. not and only is it bullshit mountain. and it doesn't make any sense but it completely undermines everything about the first film it prevents if if the idea is that Tommy Lee Jones knew who he was all along yeah that is then yeah. gone is the idea that he was this exceptional ma- guy who who stood out showed from the initiative, pack and showed yeah. initiative. And it just becomes a kind of, oh, Tommy Lee Jones has been keeping an eye on him. And it's that classic thing where they think they're expanding the universe, but they're making it smaller and it yeah. feels less exciting as a result. I hate it. I really don't like it. And it's it's, it's just so badly handled as well. Like the, yeah. the character is just sort of thrown in at the end. And then it's like, oh, that's, your, that's the dad. Also, in terms of having an arc, you know, young... Tommy Lee Jones has this moment where he talks to the kid and there's a little bit of... Very creepy ending. (laughs) Well, we're also... I get that they did have neuralizers, so perhaps they wiped Will Smith's memory when he was six so he doesn't remember being at the NASA launch site. But you're telling me no one in his family, no one, like, there's no family records of anything to do with his family history and they they cover all that up so he never knows that his dad what was at the fucking moon launch like well, why the fuck is a military person who's the head of security at nasa bringing his six-year-old kid along yeah. just to and just having him sat in the car on his own not and not and not like oh i can i can get him in to to the viewing area and, and get him and the wife in and he hasn't oh. parked the car in the car park he's parked it on the beach yeah right where the thing explodes when, Maybe he's trying to kill up. the kid. It'd be a matter of public record that this guy worked there, unless they went into full-blown cover-up mode as the Men in Black. At which point you would ask, why? This is because it wasn't written in the, in the first one. It was written solely for the third one, so they never did all the groundwork. I think it was written solely for, yeah, like half of the third one before they figured out yeah. how they were going to make it make sense. And even even his death, it's just like, oh, by the way, he's still alive, boom. Um, like that kind of death. It's it's not even like it's relevant to the plot that he has to die. It it begs the questions that come with the fact that there's a moon launch a, a moon launch operation that seemingly has no involvement from the organization, the Men in Black, which is very much established and up and running and dealing yeah, with alien it's it's a, creatures. It's a space matter, isn't it? At this point. So they're well aware that space travel exists. You'd think the two would like have some sort of crossover. Maybe that's all the more reason they have to stay away from it because they're not allowed to sort of uh, help them. I've made loads of sporadic notes. We've kind of got to the end there. Have you got anything else to say, or shall I just kind of go through my stuff that I have to talk about? I did have one thought. Um, you know, in the twenties, the Wall Street crash and. You know, someone's lost their entire living They've, to the point where they they decided to to kill themselves. Yeah. Um, do you think when they did that, they were throwing themselves off the building? They thought, oh, you know, <laughs> you know, s- some s- small solace that in eighty years' time they'll make a really funny joke about this. No, I tell a, you in what, a family film. <laughs> tell you what, for me, that's the funniest part of the film. Like, I genuinely <laughs> think I laughed out loud. <laughs> <laughs> So the bit where the bit where David Cross is going to kill his mom in the second one because Will Smith's <laughs> being a bit like blase, yeah, with, with his job, and the bit where they're just like doing a suicide joke in the third film that feels. <laughs> oh yeah, and I genuinely found it really funny. But I know what you're saying. I've made a note that it feels completely out of place in this film. I've also <laughs> made the note that this film is just throughout weirdly fucking violent. For what is basically a family film, did you not think it was a very violent movie? What happens in violence? Well, repeatedly, Jermaine Clement shoots people in the head, repeatedly, with big barbed spike things. A lot of people get shot in the head, like, and you see it, and I think because it's an alien rather than a bullet, it's alright. Will Smith smashes a slug's head in with a a pan, and again, it just feels... Yeah, he like properly like bashes his alien's head in, and it is and his his CGI special effects. Oh yeah, he his does. Getting like mangled, <laughs> and it, again, it's like I know he's an alien, but that's that that is really violent for this sort mm. of a family friendly film. There's, there's just a lot of little moments throughout that just feel... is it still a PG film? I thought it was. I think it's a twelve. A 12. Yeah, they, I think they've always mm. been twelve rated. 
Well, there you go. That's not as bad. I'm not saying it's bad. I just think it's tonally an odd decision. Well, considering you guys were talking about in the second one having a Victoria's Secret model with a bulimia issue, I don't think it's that out of place, to be honest. Tonally, surely. It just does what seems to be set up at the beginning of the second one. All we've seen violence-wise in the other two films is aliens getting shot with lasers and exploding in a ball of goo. Is Yeah, okay, fair enough. It's not quite as graphic as this en- enjoys. In this one, there is a there are l- countless dead bodies left in Boris's wake with like spikes through the head. It's yeah. pretty violent for what is essentially a family film. It's just surprising. Surprising that they made that decision. Surprising that they were like okayed to do it by Sony, and Sony weren't sort of like, oh, I don't know about that. Is that gonna? Anyway, um, I want to talk about the opening scene again. Uh, I love the new the new sort of electric guitar riff on the the main theme. I like that. <laughs> that Boris is in a jail on the moon. I think that's a lovely mm-hmm. little a little thing. I don't like that it's directly uh, next to the moon landing site. Didn't <laughs> need that. I'm also not a massive fan that the, the guards in space have this, like, alien under, under wraps, under lock and key, but they don't even know that he has, like, a little symbiotic thing. I was, that can, I was thinking that's they haven't done their research. Matter. Yeah. So when they scan the cake, it will just look as it'll just look like organic matter. Their scanners are just like organic or not non-organic, but they know yeah. he's got a little organic guy who lives in his hands who's not there because they they've chained him up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was thinking there's a real lack of research having been done here. Yeah, it, it just seems it seems like they'd know a bit about the boglodites if they were working there. Um, I I don't like that there's a Frank the Pug picture in Will Smith's flat. That was weird, right? <laughs> That was weird. Uh, that was weird, but I was all right with it. It's like they're ex-lovers or something. It's just yeah. like I get. <laughs> Maybe that's it. They obviously felt they had to reference the character somehow. Yeah, but not. That's not the time or the place. Just put him they in should the have had film. all of these. They should have had all the, the you know the busts of the previous agents. Yeah, like, yeah, Mambo yeah. Glasses, Mambo glasses, Mambo glasses, dog. That would have been that fantastic. Been <laughs> yeah. Um. On that note, or have him as a puppy. What's the deal with the whole? <laughs> Are we to believe that there have only ever been fewer than 26 men in black? Well, I was thinking that earlier. And they all happen, no one's ever had the same name initially. Exemplary, yeah, exemplary candidate. I was like, oh no, we can't hire you because we've already got a J. Change your name. Yeah. Um, Isn't one of the characters referred to as double A at one point? Oh, I think so. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I wouldn't mind it if it was taking the approach of, you know, you get your A, now your B, now your C. But it isn't. It's your name is Kevin, so you're K. Yeah. It, your name's James, so you're J. I don't know, it's just a bit like, really? That's not taken? All right, it's convenient. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. I found the lack of David Cross in this film very... Um... <laughs> disturbing once you got used to him. You know, it, it it just it feels like you have him in two films. You kind of bend over backwards to bring him back in the second film. Write him a cameo in the third one. He would have worked in a similar role or like alongside the guy who plays the son. The guy who's got the time machine. Yeah, exactly. It would have been perfect. Yeah, yeah. Him. Why not working in the same store and being like, oh, hey, man, yeah. don't I know you from somewhere? And being like, Will Smith being like, no. It would have been, you know, would have been perfect. Yeah. Perfect setting. Yeah. Um, one thing I really don't like, I mean, I think basically the film's handling of time travel in general is pretty piss poor. Um, one thing I really don't like is it never even broaches the subject that surely if Agent K was erased from the last several decades of history, surely that means Will Smith isn't a man in black anymore, a man in black anymore. Yeah, true. He wouldn't have been recruited. And they don't even get into that. It's like not much has changed at all. Apart from he's not around. He's not here. And it seems like that is how you write the film. He goes to Men in Black HQ and they like they're like intruder yeah. alert, lockdown, who the fuck are you? He has to hijack a time machine and it, you could easily write some nice stakes into it. You could, you know, have some men in black pursuing him in the sixties. 
It just, I don't know, it just seems like such a... They could have done more with it, definitely. Um, what he should have done is he he comes out and then there's aliens just walking around out in the open. And he's like going up to him and like, what the fuck are you doing, man? You should out in the open like this. Yeah, yeah. And like, God, what do you think it is, the 60s? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't like that prequel Tommy Lee Jones keeps calling Will Smith slick because the implication is in the other films that he calls Will Smith slick to kind of wind him up because he says don't call me sport or skipper or anything and he's like alright slick whereas this it's like oh he just calls everyone slick so there's a point when all of history is fucked around with and uh, Will Smith goes the Boglodites but they're extinct or whatever when they're invading Mm. and Emma Emma, um, what's her name Emma Thompson goes apparently not but if time had been changed, as it she has would done, say, obviously she would not. go, no, of course they're not. What are you talking about? Well, I don't know, unless she's that's just, just her she's in just on it because she knows that he's going through. Like, she knows that he's telling she's the truth being, now. Yeah, All right. It's just her character. Worst point then, the big climactic moment of the film where Will Smith uh, saves the day, doesn't make any fucking sense within the rules of time travel as established in the film. He runs at Boris the Animal. He gets stabbed repeatedly by several barbs that are shot at him. He then jumps off the thing. And what should happen, what should happen at this point, is he travels back in time to about three minutes earlier, and he's still stabbed with several barbs. And then he gets shot with even more barbs and dies. But what actually happens is somehow he reverts back to the state his body was in several minutes before, whilst retaining all of his memory of what just happened. It, it, it's completely inconsistent with the time travel as it's happened up until this point, and it's it's just, it's just shit. Also, it assumes that the way that Boris shoots his things is exactly the same, no matter what the person target moves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. That's chaos theory. Yeah, and it doesn't make any sense. Also, it doesn't really work as a sequence. Like, it just feels like, well, he's travelling back in time. What? What's happening? Oh, he's Okay. Oh, what's next? It's like it's just so kind of thrown mm. in, uh, not used. Uh, yeah. I think they really felt like they were being clever with yeah. it, and that's why it's in there. Yeah. You know. Well, it could have worked with a bit of a tweak, but it's it just doesn't doesn't make sense. Um, also, uh, we haven't mentioned Griffin. Yeah, Michael. Yeah, Schoolberg, that was weird. Who we all like. Who I imagine you're a huge fan of. He seems very much like your kind of actor, Alan. Wait, well, we've mentioned him. We've praised him on the show. He was in, he plays the dad in um, that film where you, uh, older guy shags the young French boy. Ooh, Call I me by your name. One. Oh yeah, yeah. He's yeah, the dad in that. Yeah, yeah. We we praised his performance. Uh, yeah, he's one of those actors that just pops up and is you know solid. Yeah. Here he plays a weird little. <laughs> sort he of... plays adult version of the kid in About a Boy. <laughs> Kelsey Grammer. That's my reference. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, All right, Calvin. <laughs> I um, I really didn't particularly like this character when I first watched the film. I found him a lot less annoying for whatever reason on the rewatch. I I like. He felt very convenient. Yeah, I mean, I like the idea of a five dimensional being. I I love it, in fact. But I just didn't like how they realized it when I first watched this. And I think the, the fact that he's just watching a reality through a portal in front of him when he's watching that game. It's like, well, that's a very th- basic three-dimensional representation of what he's presumably... That doesn't come across like he's experiencing all reality at once and all possible reality. It just comes across like he's watching a, a game on TV. Mm. I don't know. I think, it, I think it works. They kind of make it viable within the context of a, you know... I think the way that Michael Stuhlbarg plays it really, really sells it very well. Like yeah. It, it brings enough big character to it to make it just go, okay, he's a kind of a weird guy. Tell you what doesn't like it work. Could be, it could be done so easily, badly. I'll tell you what doesn't work. Andy Warhol. No, no, no. I'll tell you what doesn't work. <laughs> the worst it. part of this film, and it is unforgivable, and I hate it still, still on Griffin, at the end, when he addresses the camera and goes... Oh, this is my favorite reality. Oh, oh no, he's not gonna leave a tip. Oh, there's a meteor in space that's irrelevant to that. Oh, oh, good thing I remembered to leave a tip. Oh, thank God he remembered to leave a tip. What the fuck are you doing? You've ruined the film. I was enjoying (laughs) that. You've ruined it. (laughs) 
It did seem like an unnecessary tag on. I think that's a big reaction, but uh, it did seem. Don't a address bit the camera in the <laughs> third film in the again. franchise. I mean, would would you like to know what happens when a, a huge rock hits a satellite in space? It just blows up, doesn't it? No, everything it doesn't. Sucked. It it passes straight through the satellite and it, like it's butter. Oh, that's meant, what happens. I thought you meant within yeah, then... the context of this film. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, also, the previous two films have ended with a kind of running thing of, like, Earth being this insignificant speck. You know, we're just a marble in an alien's game of marbles. We're just inside a, a locker. Not that that really makes any sense, but it just kind of felt like, well, you do this, you end these films with that then, don't you? You yeah, I'm sure you could do an interdimensional, we'll do interreality kind of. version of that, where like the, this insignificant reality, or I just hate it. There's no rap song in this one. I mean, there is. Fucking Pitbull does a shit rap that isn't isn't an acceptable. Miami equals black mass, black gloves with a little bit of rope to tie. I flipped it, black suits, white shirts, black glasses with a matching tie, like Agent J or Agent K, and I wish the whole world would. Okay, I'm trying to make a billion out of 15 cents. Understand, understood, I'm a hope, get a move and shake a culture. Bury a border, record breaker, won't you? Give credit where credit is due, don't you? Know that I don't give a number two. Just oh, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna do a backwards jump. Actually, I think it's the second one. It, the bit that felt most shoehorned Will Smith, other than the you come from the planet damn kind of thing, um, was in the post office where he just kind of goes into boom. <laughs> oh no, I like that. I thought that was that, not. No, I like that. Was that was cheap. That was cheap. What it's was like that? a different alien language. Oh no, it's I a, get it. Yeah. But it was like, we're using Will Smith to the most of Will Smith. Yeah, it's not like Will like Smith that. is a natural... famous beatboxer. He's just. <laughs> I don't think he's ever beatboxed on one of his songs. Really? Can your friends do this? Can your friends do that? Can your friends pull this? Out of their little hat. Can your friends go? I'm the genie of the lamb. I can sing rap dance. He's a rap guy. Yeah, if he'd gone, if he'd turned around to an alien and started going, Wiki wiki wah wah. Aha, aha. <laughs> now this is a story all about how your life got flipped, <laughs> yeah, turned okay. upside down. Because you're an alien, and now you live on Earth. If Will Smith, right, it, working to the best of Will Smith's abilities would be if Will Smith gets back to 1969 and he has to go undercover and he dresses up like an old granny in like a wig. <laughs> I think you're moving with your auntie and uncle in Bel Air. You're thinking of mine, Lawrence again. <laughs> and, he's, and he's teamed up with DJ Jazzy Jeff. And then, and then Jazzy Jeff tries to get into like a hotel, but they won't let him in because he's, he's black. And then <laughs> the, and, and the security guard throws him out of the hotel. And it's just a sh- it's shot from below. And it's like a dummy. And it just goes... <laughs> 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 Yeah, <laughs> he keeps trying to get into the into that into this the the moon launch, and Uncle Phil keeps throwing him out. <laughs> <sighs> I think the third film is a mess, but it's similar to the second one. It's a very watchable mess. I think the general consensus is that yeah. the third film is a, a step up from the second one. Personally, I think it's actually a, a slight dip down from the second one. I think it's less funny. It's messier. But I can still sit through it, enjoy it quite a lot. So I give it a seven again. Another week, seven. Yeah, I mean, I gave it a seven as well, which is a st- step up from the second one for me. Um, but yeah, not not by much. Just yeah, watchable. Well, mine's the same rationing as Sol. Actually, I I gave this a seven too. Well, well yeah. seems like we've pretty. We actually seem to be quite similar on this, on this one. one. Yeah, it's Men in Black, isn't it? Everyone loves it. Well, I've, I well, I don't think they do. I I feel like Men in Black. Is under it's underserved. so under the radar. Yeah, it just yeah, it, 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 it deserves better. 
And, you know, it's the fact yeah, it took him 10 definitely. years to do Men in Black 2 to Men in Black 3. Fair enough. Put that down to Will Smith. But then it took him seven years to get round to being like, you know what? These don't actually need Will Smith in them at all. Which oh, seem But they do. I don't think seen they the do. Trailer they really do. Film? I haven't seen the trailer. And in oh, fact, only today I saw a thumbnail of the trailer and I was like, why the fuck are these people in it? What, Chris Hemsworth so and I'm... Tessa Thompson, two wonderful yes. comedy performers, great actors, very likeable presences. Is Chris Hemsworth known as a great comedy performer? Yeah, ever since ever I since he was the best there. thing in the Ghostbusters reboot and then Thor Ragnarok and Avengers Yeah, Endgame. but hang on, the best thing in the Ghostbusters reboot, that's a low bar. Would it be okay if I bring my cat to work sometimes? Uh, he has major anxiety problems. You know what? I, I would love to let your cat live here with you, but I have a pretty severe cat allergy. Oh, I don't have a cat. He's a dog. His name's my cat. Your, your dog's name is my cat? And Mike Hat. Your dog's name is Mike, last name Hat. Well, his full name is Michael Hat. I can't say that I'm allergic to dogs, so. Yeah, that's all right. He lives with my mum. Well, then okay. we have that figured out. Was... One down, no cat. All right, all right. But then Thor Ragnarok and Avengers Endgame, they realized Thor was the comedy Avenger. Welcome. Voice activation required. Thor. Access denied. Uh, Thor, son of Odin. Access denied. God of Thunder. Access denied. Strongest Avenger. Access denied. Strongest Avenger. Access denied. Damn you, Stark. Point break. Welcome, point break. But now now we've just got Thor in Men in Black. He, he's doing the same yeah. shtick. Is, is this all that Chris Hemsworth can do now? Because it's all he's I've ever seen He's not the right casting. He's... I don't think he's the right casting for it because you know it's not like he's Chris Pratt that had a a, a history of well, background a lot, he's comedy. He's much better than Chris then... Pratt. Chris Pratt's just a oh, Chris Pratt's just a dickhead. Oh, controversial. Controversial. Well, he, he is. <laughs> but the the point is, he he had a comedy beginning, whereas this is like Chris Hemsworth being the funny Avenger doesn't mean he's actually funny. It means he's the funny Avenger. I think he's. Uh, I think he is very funny because my understanding is he improvised pretty much everything he did in that Ghostbusters film. And Tessa Thompson's great too, right? You like Tessa Thompson, don't you, Judy? She was in Creed. She's a real sort of flavor of the month. Yeah, she. Well, that's that she's, seems dismissive. She's, she's the fine. she's the new big thing, isn't she? Yeah. She's uh, she's good. But I mean, I've seen the trailer, but I've seen I saw a couple of different trailers that had slightly different sort of flavors to them. Neither of them made me want to watch the film at all. It do, really do the trailers looks... for Men in Black two and three make you want to watch the film particularly? I'm... Yeah, because it's like, oh, great, yeah. Will Smith. Yeah. It's people you know. You know who? You know who else is a very good performer? Kumail Nanjiani, Rebecca Ferguson, Emma Thompson, who's coming back as a bit of connective tissue. The point Rafe is, Spar. there's no reason for them to be bo- booting this. S- you know, there's no reason to do a fourth film and it's way too there's late in the day to have a major to do a cast change. Film, and it's no, not too late. No, there's not. What are you talking about? Men in Black is like you can make a thousand of these. It's not some big ongoing yeah, thing. Yeah, you can, but you shouldn't. Why? Because they're doing that with every other film and it's really annoying. <laughs> this is something that they didn't need to redo anything. And I just think after having three set films, a really solid trilogy of one I set of call actors, it a really why solid the fuck trilogy on the f- at all? I think it's a very unsolid trilogy. It's an excellent film and two weaker follow up sequels. And But the point is it's got the same cast in it, it's got returning characters, it's got a story and that follows all the way through. So in terms of that, it There's feels pretty solid. But the fourth the film, well, no, it's not. Effectively, there now is because you get the origin. I mean, shoddily done, but there's origins of Will Smith. There's the whole Tommy uh, Lee Jones yeah, character's but past. You, but you it, liked you like Agent T. I spoke about um, how like Will Arnett right. in the third one. So yeah, for the for the ten minutes that Patrick Warburton did it, yes, I didn't find it offensive. But this is a fourth film. Look, this is this is a new take on Men in Black. Right, this is a new take yeah, on it. It's like taking that, that idea the and then going, okay, well, let's bring some new characters in. It's it's essentially a soft reboot that we're setting in the same world. Yeah, and I think that's fine. But I think that's fine. It's like, okay, we can reimagine this. We can update the technology a bit and do it. I think that's fine. I just think, based on what I've seen of the trailer, it's not going to work, and it's just going to be crap. I don't think 
That's how I'm I feeling. think comedy trailers are notoriously not a good indication of what the film's going to be like, so I'm not going to judge it based on whether or not I find the trailer funny. I think that the, the big thing is they're going international in this film. That's fine. I like a lot of the actors in it. Uh, Liam Neeson's also in it. And... Uh, <laughs> oh, I'll expect more of that then. And, um, <laughs> Definitely not Welsh or Scottish Liam Neeson. No, Liam Neeson is the head of the British Men in Black organisation, I believe, which they have to team up with at one point. But then that's, that's a great idea. I want to see that. I want to see what the British Men in Black organizations like and i i think there's a lot of life in this world i think you really could just do hundreds of men in black films because it's just it's just completely standalone adventures in a world with aliens and there's so much like like there's so much untapped potential in this franchise still that was tied down by will smith and tommy lee jones and i really well, don't I, think you i need agree those two for it to work and i think or not now it's tied right... down by chris hemsworth i think chris hemsworth is the major mistake here i mean i he wouldn't have been my choice and i and i, and I might be wrong but i i think everyone's gonna go and watch this film and go oh look it's thor because he's playing exactly the same character in the same way and so we're gonna immediately identify with that i think if it doesn't work it won't be because he's in it i think it'll be because they've gone ahead with a crappy script, like largely like Men in Black 2 and 3, arguably. I think it's going to be weekly written. I think it's going to be much more action-focused rather than comedy. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise so, me. So the comedy will be second rate. I think Chris Hemsworth is it's just going to feel like watching Thor in Men in Black, and that's going to... There's no fault of Chris Hemsworth. That's what he does. It's like that's who he is, right? But I think that's going to hurt it. I think Tess, Tess Thompson's going to be mediocre, Um and a little bit yeah, but you you don't like Tessa Thompson anyway. I like Tessa Thompson. I think she's good. I don't have a problem with her particularly. Isn't she in Thor? She's in Thor Ragnarok. Yeah, no, she's yeah, Thor's mate. Yeah. Oh, maybe they can. So what about uh, they've got F. Gary Gray in to direct it? Yeah. Does that mean anything to you? It doesn't really mean much to me. I know he did Fast and Furious Eight. <sighs> yeah. Well, F. Gary Gray is someone who came came up through <laughs> Ice Cubes, basically, and yeah, yeah. Oh and God, yeah, he did Friday. Three yeah. or whatever, didn't and he? It, it, his career had basically stalled until he did Straight Outta Compton, which is obviously with Ice Cube, uh, and that really reignited. It. it was a good film, really reignited his career. But uh, and then he did Fast and Furious off the back of that. Now Men in Black. So, uh, but yeah, he's never done anything that's really mm. won me over. Straight Outta Compton was very good, but it's it's a good story though. You know why I'm so happy about this film being made, right? In Hollywood as it stands now, the way Hollywood works, this should be a reboot. Wipe the slate clean, do it again. And it's not. They've gone, no, fuck it. The world's fine. It like Just because Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith aren't in it, who cares? This world we set up is great. We've got Emma Thompson in it. We've got the music from the original series, the main theme. We've got Frank the Pug and the Worms. Like, yeah, keep going with this world. It's great. I'm happy to watch new characters in this world and see it expanded with yeah. different characters. I'm I'm all for that. And I will happily watch hundreds of these with new different characters. I, I mean, I imagine their aim is going to be to do Men in Black 5 and 6 with the same leads. But to be honest, you know, I'd like it if they just give us a new bunch of agents every time, you know. Give us... To know who would you put in a Men in Black film, Alan? A, eh? you casting Men in Black Five? Uh, Vince Vaughn. Oh, um, oh, I would love it. I don't even like these <laughs> Vince Vaughn films. You love Vince Vaughn <laughs> and John Favreau and Martin Lawrence. Ah, uh, <laughs> Men in Black Five. I was gonna, I was gonna, uh, you know, move away from John Favreau because if you have Vince, like these days, you need to have a, a man and a woman. Um, so yeah. Vince Vaughn and uh, Leslie Mann. Leslie Mann? <laughs> Fucking bizarre choice. <laughs> I mean, I like her, but what are you doing referencing her? What about... <laughs> this is for your benefit. Kristen Wiig. Thank you. <laughs> yeah? And... No, don't say Melissa McCarthy. <laughs> well, I was going to say that just to piss off everyone on the internet. It'd be really funny. <laughs> what, but genuinely, what about Kristen Wiig and Maya Rudolph? I don't know the second one. She, she's like a Saturday I'm, Night Live. I'm fed up of seeing Kristen Wiig doing female reboots of things. I'd prefer, she's done it um, once. Well, there you go. That was enough. <laughs> I'd prefer What's Her Name out of Ghostbusters, the other one that everyone liked. Kate McKinnon. All right, what about... What about... I mean, I would say Kumail Nanjiani, but he's voicing someone in this. That might be a bit weird. Emma Stone. 
and Jonah Hill. Because they're mates now, aren't they? I don't know. Emma, Emma Stone always seems a bit too straight. Yeah, Jonah Hill. Yeah. All right, what about... Yeah. Channing Tatum. <laughs> Channing Tatum. Jonah, like, Jonah it, Hill. It would just be 21 Jump Street. And Channing Street. Tatum. And, yeah. and it is 21 Jump Street. Yeah? Perfect. We, I think we've talked about this before. We've we've done this discussion before. But who is the the modern Will Smith? Who's your who's that charismatic? He's not dead. He's pretty much still. I know, him. but who's the charismatic <laughs> sort of twenty nine year old who does leads in comedy um, action? Chris Pratt, but he's not twenty nine. Mm. But he's not, is it? Like, that's what I'm talking about. That's... I mean, Chris. I think Chris Pratt definitely moved into that with the whole mm. uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, Jurassic but I think World. everyone's getting sick of Chris Pratt now, and they've had enough of him. No, you are. <laughs> There's def. We are definitely on the cusp of Chris Pratt backlash, and I might be leading the way with that, but I'm <laughs> telling you, it's coming. Yeah, people don't. I agree. Then. Right, Adam Sandler <laughs> and Rob Schneider. <laughs> no, no, no. And Steve Buscemi can be the, the two alien. Of them should never meet again. <laughs> Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> that I would pay to see, yes. That is your go-to. Matthew Broderick and Nathan Lane. <laughs> oh. Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd. <laughs> Just being silly. You could do a Desperados thing and have Steve Buscemi with Antonio Banderas. Antonio Banderas. What did, oh, when, have you watched, when did you watch Desperado? Very recently, obviously. I uh, don't know. <laughs> That's a strange reference for you to pull. Well, I was, no, I was just thinking of Steve Buscemi, and then I was like, you know what? I was thinking in that film, I wished I'd seen more of him working with Antonio Banderas. So then I was like, oh, you know what? Double team them up together. I'll tell you what I'd like to see as the the men in black. Steve Coogan, double act, and <laughs> and no, and never. Uh, the British. This is the British men in black. Steve Coogan and Rob Brydon. Rob Brydon. <laughs> no, what's her as name? The Ruth, British Ruth men Jones. Black. Ruth Jones. Um, and Steve Coogan. I'll tell you who I'd want. This is it, right? This is the this is the winner. Quentin Tarantino and Werner Herzog. <laughs> no, Werner Herzog's an alien. I've dwelt among the humans. Their entire culture is built around their penises. It's funny to say they're small. It's funny to say they're big. I've been at parties where humans have held bottles pencils, thermoses in front of themselves and called out, hey, look at me, I'm Mr. So-and-so dick. I've got such and such for a penis. I never saw it fail to get a laugh. All right, that's enough. And Stephen Graham is an alien as well. <laughs> oh, fucking alien, aren't I? <laughs> that's, that's it, it's in the R-rated <laughs> Men in Black follow-up. <laughs> uh, oh, dear. Are we... Shouldn't we be doing Men in Black in Space? Isn't that the obvious? I think Men in Black 4, you just kind of prove you can do it without Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah. Men in Black 5, Ooh. then you get a bit high concept again. And they've already done yeah. time travel. So yeah, that is when you do Men in Black in Space. I don't think we're going to see a Men in Black 5. But they won't, they'll just, I think they'll drown in that environment. You know, it's, it's, it's too big. Well, okay, the point, <laughs> point is, it's just, it's too big and they'll be insignificant because humans won't be anywhere near useful enough whereas on earth at least it's like they're yeah well it's, it's i mean i guess this is a big step out because it, it's been new york hasn't it that's kind of been yeah i'll tell you what i'd do i would go i would go the men in black they have to they get they somehow get onto a spaceship that is coming towards earth to attack it and they have to they have to stop this spaceship disable but it. Yeah. everything's scaled up massively because they're huge aliens so it's like a land of the giants mm. style thing and they have to run around uh, and like Prometheus, get ship like a style. safety pin and sling it over their shoulder and, and all that sort of the borrowers, stuff. yeah, land of the giant stuff. I love all that. We haven't had, done anything like that for ages. I'd go for that, yeah. Not enough of that in Ant Man. All right, I mean, let's do that, but not a spaceship. It's like a portal to another dimension or something. It just yeah, okay, that'll work. What about Jordan Peele and Keegan Michael Key? <laughs> they're, they're the new hot level <laughs> that, would, that would definitely bring a, a, a new flavour to it uh, might get a bit socio-political it's okay I can, I can handle a bit of that in my men in black Sasha Baron Cohen is an alien 
as the villain. <laughs> as the let's villain, cast the villain. Let's cast actually, the villain. Sasha Baron Cohen. Sasha Baron Cohen as a villain would work fantastically well. I, I, I just get a real feel from this film of corporate production. I, mm-hmm. I, and, and, you know, Men in Black was that. So well, that's what I mean. I, 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 agree I, I just you. think if you put a, a really, a, a director with some real you know, vision or uh, or a writer who can really bring something to it or or that central central figure. Yeah, or or someone like, oh yeah, or even, yeah, like you said, um, Jordan Peele, like at least he would bring something different to it and bring something interesting to it. Yeah. Might not work. I I know, no, I I completely agree. I completely agree. I think this does have the feel, well, it is a corporate product completely. It feels like one, but like you say, the other films are, and that's why I just don't really... I don't mind. I I think it's a shame they're not but I, treating I, but it I with think, more reverence than they are. But but I think Men in Black is a fantastic example of a Hollywood product when they know what they're doing and they're doing yeah. it well. Yeah. But I yeah. also think there's a lot of that goes into that, which is look and circumstance and being at the right place at the right time. A lot of that is Will Smith just being completely at the crest of a yeah. wave. Yeah. And 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 you know that is such a simple. Okay, Will Smith's not available. Get Martin Lawrence, and that film does not work in the same way. I know you said it would, but I don't, I don't think it would. It would still be watchable and fine, but I am cautiously optimistic. Is how I would describe my feelings with this. This yeah. could be a film that I'm very happy with. I, I could very easily come out of it thinking eight out of ten, great, loved it, G- great fun. Not as good as the first, but really good fun. Happy with it. Similarly, I won't be remotely surprised if I go and watch it and think, "Ugh, come on, guys!" But I'm yeah, not well, going to pass judgment on the trailer being like, "Yeah." Well, I will because that's what trailers are there for. I'm cynically <laughs> pessimistic about it. Yeah, yeah but you're you're so... you also have a very bad track record of judging how you're going to feel about stuff based on the trailer. Do no, you, I, I was going to say, do not bring up Suicide Squad again. Let the man the trailer, have his piece. But I, I think at best, at very best, this film is going to be a oh, sort of all right bit of entertainment, 6 out of 10. We'll can see. I can I pitch Can I pitch an actor playing an alien to you to go out on? Of course. All right. Louis Theroux. <laughs> oh, bless his face. <laughs> yeah. He'd be great. Hello. He he works on the he works on the desk where they're all coming in. Hello, what planet are you from? Are you an alien? <laughs> oh, all right. There you go. I mean, I'm just ripping off what you said in our Godzilla episode, Alan. But <laughs> Men in Black, directed by Armando Iannucci, <laughs> about the British Men in Black, and it's just really just based in the office. Lots it's, of admin. It's just a big. <laughs> it's just a big Brexit satire. <laughs> Oh dear. The Earth is trying to secede from the Union. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> There's an intergalactic treaty that Earth's trying to get out of. It all goes wrong. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Peter so Capaldi's in it. The men in black are <laughs> Peter Capaldi and Louis Theroux. Oh dear. No, that, that'd be, that wouldn't work. Peter Capaldi. Very dry. Peter Rebecca Capaldi Front. and... No, no, no. Um, we can do better than that. Come on, Peter Capaldi. <laughs> And Tams and Greg. No, no, no. Peter Capaldi and Fleabag. Phoebe <laughs> yeah, Wallabridge. Phoebe Wallabridge. She's hot right now. Yeah, she's very yeah. Hot right now. Her and Peter Capaldi. There you go. That is your Men in Black. He's the grumpy old one. She's the sarky Will Smith who's being recruited. She doesn't. She's young and like arrogant. Doesn't you know? Has a problem with authority. But it's the British equivalent, and it is. That's that is the British equivalent of Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith. I'm saying it. It's right. That's that's it. That's a pitch. That's Men in Black Four. We've solved he Men in Black. Like he's, sounds like he's <laughs> wrapping up. I say we go with it. <laughs> Louis Theroux has a cameo in it, not as himself, but as an alien. And <laughs> we just need we need like a solid gold uh, vocal, like someone vo- voicing a uh, Stephen Merchant. There you go. No, they, he's just playing an alien flat out. He's just playing <laughs> an alien. Dumb. Oh, dumb hello. Dumb. He, he just plays an alien who like. Does the desk at HQ? No, someone goes up to him and goes, "That is the worst <laughs> human I've ever seen." Like, right. Oh, can we just oh, have? Human? Can the alien? Can there be like a trio of like alien, like you know, tech guys who they go to, kind of like the um? If you ever watched the X Files, they had their like three guys in the basement they went to when they needed stuff, and it's just Gervais Merchant and Pilkington. <laughs> 
no makeup on them. They're just, but they are aliens. <laughs> they all look like little alien men anyway. <laughs> little round bowling ball man, like like Men in Black Three, postal worker alien Men in Black Two, and Ricky Gervais. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. That's that's Men in Black. Then we basically enjoyed it, didn't we? Yeah. Woo! All right. So uh, thanks for listening. Thank you, Judy, for joining us again. Thank um, you for having me. You can support us at Patreon dot com forward slash Dim Returns for one dollar a month, uh, and you get lots of extra content. We do mini episodes. Uh, Judy is signed up. She's a she's a member of the team now. Feeling, she gets all that extra goodness. Feeling like that was money well spent, Judy. I'm seeing, I'm seeing the effects. Yes, straight, yeah, I'm, I'm raking straight, in those goodies straight in my back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> <Dollar on. laughs> you know what I do with that money, Judy? I I take it out of the bank and I just look at it like that's Judy's money. That is, <laughs> and then I he puts it, yeah. puts it on the bed and rolls around. On <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I don't. Of course, it goes towards our, our maintenance costs, um, hosting. We've nearly, we very nearly covered our um, running costs. We're, we're at like 97% covered or something. So thank you. Huge thank you. Very sincerely to everyone who's pledged so far. And uh, Yes. Yeah. Although Japanese Bond is creaming off 20%, which we didn't know about. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> Be expected, someone's, got to, someone's got to pay his golf fees. Yeah. <laughs> All that fake town it adds up. Right, that's that then. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Bees. Bees. Now freeze. Well, there we go. Hope you enjoyed that surprisingly in-depth look at the Men in Black series. But of course, the fun doesn't stop here. You can head over to patreon.com forward slash dim returns and gain access to all sorts of bonus content, including fully-fledged bonus episodes of the show. Uh, so far, we did one for Avengers Endgame, one for Jordan Peele's film Us. Uh, there's also Diminisodes, which we put out fairly regularly, covering upcoming releases. We'll be doing one for Men in Black International once we've seen that. Uh, there's a whole load of those up, and we try and put them out as often as possible. Um, there's other things, including Patreon votes, where we let you vote for the topics we'll be covering in upcoming episodes. And we are just about to launch a Patreon vote to decide the topic of our upcoming Halloween episode this year. So if you want to have your say in that, check it out, patreon.com forward slash dim returns. For as little as $1 a month, you too can help us keep the lights on. And if you would like to help the show out, but you're too cheap or lazy to chuck us a dollar a month, uh, no disrespect, I totally get it, but it would be massively, massively, massively appreciated if you would take the time to go to iTunes and chuck us a rating and a review. We've had a wonderful wonderful amount of you already do that for us thank you ever so much to everyone who has already but if you haven't please do do that because it'd be massively helpful to us and thanks again to judy for being in this week's episode here's where a lesser show would do a joke about neuralizing you so that you don't remember anything i've just said all right love you all bye Stand for peace.